morning, everyone, and welcome to the sixth meeting in 2015 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. Everyone present is reminded to switch off mobile phones as they do affect the broadcasting system. As meeting papers are provided in digital format, you may see tablets and other mobile devices being used during the meeting. The first item is to hear evidence on the draft National Bus Travel Concession Scheme for Older and Disabled Persons Scotland Amendment Order 2015 from Derek Mackay, Minister for Transport and Islands, Tom Davey, Team Leader, Bus and Local Transport Policy, and Nancy Woodhead, Concessionary Travel Policy Manager at the Scottish Government. This instrument is laid under affirmative procedure, which means the Parliament must approve it before the provisions may come into force. Following this evidence session, the Committee will be invited to consider a motion to approve the instrument under Agenda Item 2. Can I welcome the witnesses this morning, and can I invite the Minister to make any opening remarks? Thank you very much, convener, and good morning, and thank you for inviting me to discuss the draft National Bus Travel Concession Scheme for Older and Disabled Persons Scotland Amendment Order 2015. The order sets the reimbursement rate and the cap level of funding for the National Concessionary Travel Scheme in 15-16 and 16-17. In doing so, it gives the agreement that we've reached in January with the Confederation of Passenger Transport representing the Scottish bus industry. That agreement was based on a reimbursement model developed in 2013 on the basis of independent research commissioned by the Scottish Government. The research was extensively discussed at the time with CPT and their advisors. The model in recent discussions and updating the various inputs to it, including forecasts based on the historical trends and agreed indices, have given us a good basis for informed decisions which will apply stability and clarity for all parties. Using the updated model, we've concluded that the appropriate rates for reimbursement in 2015-16 and 16-17 should be 57.1% and 56.9% of the adult single fare, respectively. These rates, we believe, will most closely deliver the aims set out in the legislation establishing the scheme that bus operators should be no better, no worse off as a result of participating in it. Based on these rates and our expectations for future changes in journey numbers and fares, we forecast budget requirements of 202 million and 212 million over the next two years. That's 414 million pounds, of course. These figures are also reflected in the draft order as budgetary caps. The order is limited to the next two years, we've agreed with CPT, uh, and the reimbursement model will be reviewed during the year 1617 to ensure that it continues to provide a fair deal for all parties and an appropriate mechanism for determining future payments. We know that older and disabled people greatly value the free bus travel which the scheme provides and which enables them to access local services, visit friends and relatives and gain from the health benefits of a more active lifestyle. The order would provide for these benefits to continue on this two-year basis and uh, on that basis that is fair for operators and affordable for taxpayers. And I commend it to the committee for their consideration and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Minister, for that opening statement. Um, can I invite members to ask any questions of the Minister? Alex. <coughs> Am I the only one? Is there any surprise there? <laughs> the, the, the Minister uh, has brought forward the order uh, which covers the requirements of the scheme, but uh, continues to propose the order on the basis that it should provide uh, free travel for the elderly uh, from the age of 60. Uh, many people don't believe that 60 is elderly anymore. Uh, and in view of the growing cost of the scheme, it has been suggested by myself and others that it would be more appropriate to align entitlement uh, to the scheme to pension age rather than the age of 60. Uh, with the cost going up uh, and the effect this has on the overall uh, budget for support uh, of the bus industry, has the Minister given any consideration whatsoever to the idea of changing the age of entitlement? Uh, I'm delighted that Mr Johnson has asked the question without expressing a preference as any good politician would do. I also take the point that some people don't see the age of 60 is being particularly old. I've spent most of my life wanting to be older. Now I've hit tipping point. I want to be younger again at the age of 37. I'm quite far off from the uh, uh, travel uh, arrangements myself, as of course is Mr Johnston. But of course it is the case. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> of course it's the case that government considers options. But we set out 
uh, a commitment around continuing with this scheme. And this scheme, clearly because of the two-year arrangement, uh, will, will continue through the, the term of, of this Parliament. It will be for all politicians to decide the eligibility criteria uh, going forward. Uh, there are some who believe that the age of entitlement should be raised to the pension age. There's some consistency around that. But for the time being, uh, we stick to the uh, 60 uh, age limit. That's what's established in the scheme. That's what we've carried through this, this parliament. Then it'll be for everyone to consider their position going into the next election. It may surprise Mr Johnson to learn, though, if you think that it would have a massive impact on the cost, the total cost of the scheme, I don't believe that it would, which would then beg the question, is the system change worth any financial saving that may be made? That then brings in the other element of the discussion. If you were to expand the scheme, who else would you consider? And I think there's a very strong argument to um, consider extending the scheme to others, those seeking work, <coughs> those at the younger end of the, the spectrum who might require support with travel as well. So these are issues for all politicians to consider as they approach, frankly, their manifesto in the next Scottish Parliament elections. But this government uh, will continue with the scheme uh, as we have outlined and sustained so far. There, there, there are indeed uh, a number of groups who we would, uh, many of us would wish to see the scheme extended to. But savings uh, could be used for a number of purposes. But, of course, one of the key groups who are not able to take advantage of the service are those who are not near bus routes and those who rely on community transport uh, in order to support their uh, travel requirements, quite often serious travel requirements, uh, are not able to access bus services where they do not exist. One of the savings, uh, or one of the things that savings could be used for within the scheme is to extend support to community transport. Has that been given any consideration? I, I think that's also a very fair question and point that Mr Johnston puts uh, in terms of the provision of the scheme to community transport. It, politics is indeed about choices, and if the position of the Conservatives was to uh, remove it from the age category of 60 to 65, or whatever the pension age entitlement is for, for that person, of course not remove I'm sure you wouldn't be suggesting removing a pass from anyone who's currently a holder. I'm sure you're proposing just uh, new applicants and entrants to the scheme, but even in those circumstances, it would be about choices. I don't think that is a direct equivalent and a direct choice for the reason I'm about to give. Community transport, in terms of eligibility and financial support, should get more support. Of that, I have no doubt. And I'm not one for passing the buck. However, there is provision within local authorities so to do. So if a local authority wanted to expand the community transport provision or extend concessionary schemes, they're perfectly empowered and entitled to do. And I think from that respect, it would be better if local authorities who understand the local circumstances better, who knew where the gaps in transport provision were, address that gap if they felt it was a gap. And that would help in the scenarios where Mr Johnson quite rightly indicates there might not be an adequate private sector bus provision, uh, but there may be community transport. So in terms of extending the scheme within community transport, I think that would be for local authorities to lead. The power is there and the resources are there if they choose to use them in that fashion and set it out uh, as, as a priority. Yeah. As has been the, the case in a number of years, as the cost of the uh, concessionary scheme rises, the proportion of the total support being given the, to the bus industry that goes through this scheme uh, increases. And as a consequence, things like the bus service operators grant become yeah. less significant in the, the overall scheme of things. This has a, a potential side effect of distorting the shape of bus services in Scotland. Uh, where services are targeted <coughs> at the, the growing, uh, the, the high level of market interest that uh, concessionary travellers use. And sometimes this has the effect of removing services uh, that are more often used by people who are using the bus <coughs> to go to their work, to go to college, for example. And I've had a number of cases come to me where bus services have been lost uh, uh, early in the morning 
uh, in particular because uh, priority has been given to services at other times of the day. Have you come across any evidence that suggests the pattern of subsidy is distorting the shape of bus services across Scotland? It, not particularly, because you have to look at this scheme in the round, as well as the, the other grant schemes that support uh, bus travel. So if you put it in the context of uh, bus services operators grant as well, there's a cocktail of grant support that funds the bus industry. Incidentally, 45% of all income in the bus industry in Scotland comes via government or local authority mm. grant. The rest is from the fair paying uh, public, uh, uh, of course. So I'm not, sure it, I'm not sure it distorts the market to that extent. I, I don't know if I mis heard Mr Johnston, but it's not the case that the grant subsidy, the reimbursement rate percentage is going up. It's actually... No, the, the co overall cost is going up. The percentage compensation is dropping. Uh, the percentage yep. compensation is dropping marginally. That's correct, but that's because I'm trying to squeeze the public pound, of course, and get best value uh, in terms of, of the private sector um, operators. But I do not believe that that marginal reduction in terms of an increasing budget... An increasing spend is in any way distorting uh, the market. If we then turn to uh, why routes change and why some routes aren't served, I suspect it's matters much wider than the concessionary travel scheme that we'll fund. Of course, we're not debating, as, but I am happy to, at your discretion, convener, not debating the eligibility of the scheme today, uh, but it's the mechanics of the uh, cap uh, uh, and the funding. But no, I haven't had that evidence, but I'm more than happy to receive it from local members if they believe that the scheme is in any way disadvantaging uh, local communities. But on the contrary, I suspect it's sustaining bus routes that otherwise would have disappeared. Uh, David, you wanted to ask yeah. a question? Uh, two very brief questions. Mm -hmm. um, could I ask the Minister about the wider issue? If you take your 60-year-old driver, uh, if the aim is to get modal shift to get the driver out of the car and onto the bus, or indeed active travel by cycling or walking, the Minister, I'm sure, will agree with me that you're cutting emissions, you're cutting congestion in roads, and presumably there's a wider issue about road maintenance as well. And the second brief question, has the Minister been approached by veterans' organisations, who have certainly approached me, who are very uh, keen that veterans per se um, have uh, concessionary travel? I do appreciate some will be over 60 and some will be eligible because of disability. But has the Minister had representations? It's certainly one I've had, and I'm, I've got a great deal of sympathy with the plight, obviously, of veterans in Scotland today. OK, and you can tell why Mr Stewart is my shadow. I meant what he said in his first question to him in terms of why is the concessionary scheme so important in terms of transition to the low-carbon economy, modal shift, getting people more active, reducing isolation, promoting individual independence. These are all good reasons to continue uh, with this, uh, th this scheme, and that's why um, uh, many of the over-60s uh, benefit from it. On the point around veterans, now, I want to check some of the exact detail around this categorisation. It is my understanding uh, that transport to veterans has been improved uh, over the last few years, partly because of the efforts of Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Of course, he was my predecessor, but I'm happy mm. to come back with the detail on what veterans may be entitled to. Mm. And if we need further work on that, then that will be undertaken. But from memory, I don't have the detail to hand, we have enhanced transport provision from what we inherited. The Minister agrees with me that whilst uh, the points that Alec Johnson made about aligning the bus pass with pension age and with retirement age, whilst that on the face of it might seem to be sensible and have some appeal, um, and uh, our su success in longevity, um, whilst that's to be commended, it's by no means universally spread about the country. So that in some areas of deprivation, lifespans are much shorter than in other areas, and that great care, great care, considering the health benefits that go along with this, in promoting active family, but also in maintaining links of families who these days tend to be much more dispersed than they were in a previous era, that, that um, government, I hope, would take into account these kind of factors very carefully before implementing any changes to realign with the pension age. And if I can just touch on the same question on another issue, um, uh, convener, um, 
Uh, it's relevant the to the, the, the previous discussion that in representing a predominantly rural area, I'm very aware, having spoken to bus operators, who tell me that many of the routes they operate would not be viable if not for the revenue that they derive from this bus pass scheme. So in order to keep some of those rural routes viable, this scheme is absolutely essential. And again, that's another factor in terms of considering any significant changes to the scheme that might impact adversely on rural bus services. Uh, yes, convener, I think those are all very fair points, working back from them. Uh, there's a mixture, uh, because of the bus uh, environment uh, in Scotland, of market forces, commercial interests, and of course the concessionary subsidised and locally supported schemes as well. And that's why uh, some of the provision uh, that exists does, does rely on schemes such as uh, bus services operators grant BSOG uh, and the national concessionary scheme as well. And I said earlier, and I say it again, I am convinced some of these routes would have disappeared if it wasn't for schemes such as this. And of course the rules were changed uh, to further support rural communities in terms of the last review of BSOG uh, to, to further support uh, rural uh, communities. In terms of your first point, around life expectancy in Scotland. Yes, particularly in areas of uh, deprivation and our country as a whole, life expectancy in Scotland is lower. People live uh, shorter lives in Scotland than some other parts of the UK. Now, that, that's a fact, so you bear that in mind when you're making decisions around entitlement to, uh, to services and to concessions. But also this government has a different perspective on pension age as well from UK government and that's also a consideration uh, uh, going, going forward. So the scheme that we've proposed is the scheme that we'll continue with uh, for the period of two years. That sees us through this term of parliament. I don't think there's anything wrong with members making choices, having an opinion and debating where the scheme works well and how we could change and improve it, what their priorities are. But our priority is to continue with the national concessionary scheme as proposed uh, to give that certainty to operators and to residents across Scotland who greatly, greatly value the scheme uh, in the way that it's constructed uh, at the moment. Now, it may not come as a surprise, but in a survey we've conducted, 98% of respondents stated that they were either very or fairly satisfied with the scheme overall. With that kind of record and response, it suggests, even in the west of Scotland, from where I'm from, using the colloquial term, you're doing no bad, is appropriate. And 98% are very and fairly satisfied with the scheme as we have it. Are there any other questions from members to the Minister? Okay, in that case, the second agenda item is the formal consideration of motion S4M12397, calling for the committee to recommend approval of the draft National Bus Travel Concession Scheme for Older and Disabled Persons Scotland Amendment Order 2015. Can I invite the Minister to speak to and move motion S4M12397? I formally move. Thank you. Uh, can I invite any further comments and questions from members? There are no further comments and questions. Uh, in that case, I will now put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S4M12397, in the name of Derek Mackay, be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes, we are agreed. Thank you. That concludes the consideration of this affirmative instrument. We will report the outcome of our consideration to the Parliament. And I thank the Minister and his officials for their attendance this morning. We will now allow a short suspension for a witness changeover. Thank you.
welcome our, our session. Um, the third item on the agenda today is for the committee to take further evidence on its freight transport in Scotland inquiry. This week the committee will hear from rail freight operators. Can I welcome Andrew Malcolm, Chief Executive Officer of the Malcolm Group, Ken Russell, Strategy Director at the Russell Group and Kay Walls, Commercial Manager Scotland at Freightliner. Perhaps I could kick off our questions uh, this morning and ask each of the, the panel to provide the committee with an overview of your real business and its significance to the Scottish economy, but also ask you to place that into a wider context and to outline what you see as being your strategic vision uh, for freight transport in Scotland and beyond. Perhaps we could start with you, Mr Malcolm. Thank you and good, good morning. Um, our our organisation uh, moved into rail back in 2001 um, not as an alternative to road transport, which is our core business, but alongside transport. So we very much see rail as a combined road and transport operation. Um, I often stress that road can survive without rail, but rail can't survive without road, which is a fact that a lot of people miss nowadays. You know, some people promote rail rather than road. As an organisation, we run a seven-day service twice a day, length and breadth to the UK, and we move in the region about 1,200 domestic loads on a weekly basis, north and south, uh, to support the market. Um, rail has become a very key part of our operation, um, although I say it takes years to get confidence from our client base to use it. Unfortunately, it doesn't take long to lose it uh, from that point of view. We have a number of challenges on the, the main routes in of Scotland, being the two of the, obviously, the east and west coast main line. We have restrictions on the west coast main line uh, and east coast main line, mainly due to gauge and height restrictions, which sometimes cause us delays to give our customers that service. When we started rail back in 2001, 90% of what we moved by rail was not time sensitive. People did not have the confidence in rail, but had the wish to use rail. Today, I think it's fair to say that over 90% of what we move is time sensitive. And between Russells and Malcolms, we probably move the majority of the retail sector's business to Scotland. And um, so again, it's a part that's become a very important part and a crucial part to our organisation and something that we're looking to develop further in the future. And can you place that into a wider context for us in terms of what your strategic vision would be? Our, our, well, our, our vision is, well, there's a lot of vision in our industry today with, uh, let's say, people use this terminology just in time. Um, I think the culture in the UK now is just too late. People don't plan no far enough ahead. And uh, transport is transport and how that works. Um, trucks give customers so much flexibility um, that they can, they can cut their lead time quite dramatically, whereas rail doesn't. Rail is very rigid. And all the penalties that come with rail can sometimes deter customers off rail. Um, our strategy going forward, the way, is first of all, is to make sure that what we're currently doing is sustainable, most importantly, and look at further growth. There is a UK driver shortage. So again, our strategy going forward, the way, is ideally not to put any more trucks on the road, to try and get more value at the trucks we have. And that's where rail can play its part. You can move volume based quite quickly. You can move volume without increasing the, the resource quite dramatically as well. So our strategy as a business is look to look at trying to develop more freight on rail and, again, less on road. Okay, thank you. Mr Russell? Um, very similar story to Andrew. Um, in terms of the scale of what we're doing, very similar. Um, we're operating seven days. Um, predominantly Midland, Scotland is our core route um, and vice versa. Um, but uh, we're doing about 100 loads a day um, in each direction over that route on rail. Um, rail is complementary to our services. It's not core. Um, we use rail where it fits, we use road where it's right, and we use short sea where it's right. Um, so it's a matter of choice that's best fit for the job in hand. Um, in terms of our um, further links, we also have a daily rail service that links the Midlands to London and London to um, northern France. Um, again, daily services. Um, so in terms of our um, strategy moving forward, uh, what we want to do is widen the network that we can access by rail, um, m making use of the Channel Tunnel more and links into Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, as well as our current links in France, which link us currently to Spain and all over France. OK, I mean, presumably, um, as with Mr Malcolm, you want to, to grow your business. Yeah. Yeah, but how do you see... Um, services that you provide fitting into the, the, the wider context of freight transport? Well, um, I mean, uh, some of the obstacles we have on rail at the moment um, that are 
delaying the development um, for our international stuff is the issues of gauge that Andrew mentioned. Um, we also have issues on um, HS1 where we are trying to get them to increase the size, the weight of the train they are allowed over the route. Um, currently we're restricted to 1,600 tonnes, but the channel tunnel is 1,800 tonnes. So the extra 200 tonnes wouldn't cost us any more to be able to run that, um, and it would make a significant impact on the commercials. Unfortunately, we can't get HS1 to engage with us, having been trying for about three or four months now. Um, we also are doing some load tests in the channel tunnel with weight to try and increase the capability of a single locomotive, because currently we have to use two locomotives to pull the train through the tunnel. Um, and uh, if we can get the benefits of a single locomotive, which in theory is capable of doing the job, um, it's just proving it in a test situation for um, Eurotunnel to be able to approve it. Okay. Um, the, the other problem we have generally within the UK is that the European gauge on rail is larger than the UK gauge. Um, so in European gauge, you're normally talking UIC gauge, whereas in the UK, we don't, which is equivalent to the Channel Tunnel's capability, almost, um, depending on which country you're going to. Um, we have a significant decrease in our capability other than HS1. So that has an impact on the sorts of equipment you can run by rail. And if you look at um, a lot of the inquiries we get um, for our terminal embarking coming from the continent, it's for trailers on trains coming through the tunnel, and they can only come to barking. They can't get any further because our gauge isn't capable of that. We also get inquiries for 10 foot 6 containers to be able to carry um, the likes of automotive components coming to our manufacturing plants. And again, we can't fit these on our UK gauge other than HS1. Okay. Thank you. I'm sure we'll be able to um, tease out some of those issues as we um, make progress this morning. Uh, Ms Walls, could you outline for us um, the, your, the significance of your real uh, business uh, to the Scottish economy and set out what your strategic vision is for freight transport? Freightliner is a long-established rail haulier. Um, we were established in the 1960s, uh, actually Dr Beeching, would you believe? And we were fully owned by um, British Rail, but we were privatised in 1996. We're now a private company. We started initially moving containers by train. We were the first to do it. And um, since then, uh, containerisation globally has grown. So our business has grown as a result. Um, Post-1996, we also moved into the bulk haul market, so we also run, in, in, instead of just container trains, we also run bulk trains, we run cement, coal, etc. through Scotland, waste, you know, big contracts. As far as container trains are concerned, um, our core business is moving goods inland to deep sea ports, so we're sending stuff from the UK, obviously in Scotland in this case, over to America, Far East the rest of the world. And basically, container trains just now run from Cope Bridge Freightliner Terminal with full load containers, mostly spirits, I'm afraid, thankfully. <laughs> and these go down to the big ports of Felixstowe, Southampton, uh, the, the Thames ports, London Gateway, Tilbury, and also the port of Liverpool. And these sail over to the rest of the world. Similarly, we are bringing imports from these countries up to Scotland. So a box will land at Felixstowe, destined for Scotland, we'll bring it up in our train. Coat Bridge Freight Air Terminal has been there for a long time. It was a very, very busy site. It was the biggest, I think, rail terminal in Europe at one point. Things change and fortunes alter. And in the post Hatfield, we had a few issues. We lost a lot of traffic. I'm pleased to say we're gaining it back. And the benefit we do have in Coat Bridge, it's a huge site. We've welcomed in other rail operators, so we... We have three of Ken's trains every day. We've run Malcolm's trains, you know, and it's, it's a huge site and we're looking to grow that further. I suppose strategic vision, we would like to see, I would certainly like to see Coat Bridge become an intermodal hub for Scotland, like a core terminal where you have parked trains from other areas, maybe locations in Scotland that couldn't support a full big rail terminal, a full train situation like Perth, etc. Feeding into a central strategic hub and feeding down from there, consolidating and feeding out from there. And hopefully that's the vision to come. Now, whether that happens at Coke Bridge or somewhere else, it's something I think we should be aiming for. 
and also Scotland in, in, in deep sea terms, uh, we were limited connectivity. We have options to go over to the Rotterdam, Antwerp, etc. But we've no deep sea connectivity of our own, and that's something I think we, we would all like to see. But, yeah. Thank you. I mean, I think the the last issue you mentioned in terms of. Uh, deep sea capabilities is something that uh, colleagues will want to pick up on uh, later. Uh, can I just ask the panel, and if we can start with, with you, Ms Walls, um, the Scottish Government has to prioritise uh, its spending in terms of infrastructure. What would your priorities be for action which would benefit the freight sector? I don't know. I mean, roads obviously are very important because you can't have a rail terminal without a road connection to it. So um, possibly look at where the freight's moving and try and target the spend there. One, one thing, I was dismayed when Eurocentral uh, was opened and all of the big area around about there, there was no thought given to uh, a passenger train service there. And as such, the, the roads into Eurocentral are jammed by people trying to get to work. Things like that, I suppose, joined up thinking, strategic thinking. If you want to build a big investment park or something, look at the rail link. Three heads. Uh, a, Ken's got a rail terminal across from it. Why was never a, 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 a rail link put into Bree Head? Things like that, I suppose. And more strategic overview rather than people having individual schemes who are benefiting individual companies. Look at what's good for Scotland. And I think ultimately that would benefit everyone because that would make it easier getting around about. It would reduce the cost and therefore encourage growth. Okay. Mr Russell, what, what would your um, infrastructure investment priorities be? Um, fr from a Scottish perspective, I, I would certainly be looking at um, the, the local road infrastructure that would feed the major rail terminals and sea terminals um, or ports um, to ensure that we have got the um, cleanest opportunity to get in and out. Um, and then on top of that, um, I think we would need to look at um, the West Coast, East Coast mainline access for rail and then some of the diversionary options with the, the um, Glasgow South Western and um, able to have options for the current gauge capability of the West Coast mainline um, so that we're not reliant totally on a single route, which predominantly our trains currently are. Um, and that can cause us problems. Um, and that also means that we need to have good links with um, London to ensure equally that from Carlisle we can continue to operate. Mm -hmm. Mr Malcolm? Yeah, I think I would echo what both Key and uh, Ken have said there. I mean, being a transport man at heart who's brought rail to our business, the end of the day, um, we try and bring a very practical mind to it. I mean, Scotland is a very short country from coast to coast. And you look at where the population is and also where the main freight is as well. And we look at the working time directive, driver's hours regulations as well. Again, fundamentally, our key objective, we must have the vehicles moving fast, sleek, and again, with little delays. And I share Kay's view, you know, a lot where we have rail terminals just now, we have a lot of congestion in cars um, from that point of view, which does cause a lot of delay and expense. Um, for us, likewise, we try and have a, in a road fleet, have a standard unit that can, one unit can fit all requirements. And again, likewise, we mentioned the West Coast Main Line. It's, very, it's open to nearly any size of container we have, but we need to have other containers that can then go the best routes would be around the East Coast Line, which again creates problems with customers with capacity cubed that can go on the train, yep. the flexibility, the delay, getting the train split and get around. So again, it's getting these alternative routes in place that work. But for me, fundamentally, it's having the, the terminals in the right place, and I don't think we've got a bad structure of terminals. I think a lot of investment is required in the terminals, because the terminals are expensive to run and to operate. But the road network in and out of them, again, needs a lot to be you know, done there to try and get that flowing more smoothly. OK, so you'd all be in agreement that we need investment in the road network, um, particularly um, to allow access to the terminals and then investment within each of the terminals. Has, has anyone done an assessment of what the cost of that investment would be? No. OK. Right, well, I think we'll move on. Alec, you've got some questions. There's a lot of freight that can be carried on trains, but what area, what type of freight do you think have been the success stories and what areas of freight transport require improvement to get them on rail? Maybe I can take that one. I mean, there's one area that I think could help 
The Sc Scotland's got a problem with both inbound and expound export you know, on, the, on domestic. And there's always more comes into Scotland than goes out of Scotland, so trying to balance traffic flows is a challenge for us with the road or rail. Um, I don't know Ken's own business model, but probably 90% of what we move by rail north is for the retailers. So it cubes out before it weighs out. But most of what goes out of Scotland will weigh out before it cubes out. And rail has got a massive disadvantage over road and weight capacity, because we'll normally lose between three and four tonnes capacity on rail on a road-going road vehicle, so we're less competitive. Many, many years ago, when transport moved from 40 tonnes to 44 tonnes, we had a 44 tonne opportunity with intermodal rail within a radius of the rail terminal. We lost that when they neutralised you know, 44 tonnes for all vehicles. So that's something we'd, we'd urge to have a look at. But the goods we carry mainly is, is retail-related, it's drink-related, building product-related. We, we try into any customer's goods and see how can it fit on road or rail. But most of our customers, we've got a parallel road service. We have to run the combination to give them that confidence and service. So again, it's not bespoke for just that the goods will carry on rail. They have to go on road and vice versa. But one of our issues in Scotland just now is how do we get more volume onto rail? It's trying to get more weight onto rail. Yeah, on, and it's more on the southbound journey where we can benefit Scotland and get goods to market at a price that's acceptable. I, I agree with what Andrew said. Equally, I think um, you know, if you look at our volume, the main difference between Andrew's trains, my trains, and Kay's trains is we're, com co we're concentrating more in the domestic market or the European market. Kay's concentrating in the deep sea market, predominantly on the intermodal side. Um, the other issue we have is that a lot of the European and domestic market is based on a 45-foot pallet-wide container. The deep sea market is based on a 40-foot, 8-foot wide container that you can't put two pallets in the same direction and the width. Um, so trying to persuade um, shippers to use either a European type equipment to get whiskey south or using a deep sea box to bring goods north, we'd have a big differential in the imbalance of trade. Because um, at the moment, empty containers come into Scotland in order to take whisky exports out, and we move an element of empty containers south to bring European and domestic movements north. So that, that's a challenge for us as an industry that we need to try and overcome. Is this one of these problems, or is there a solution? There are solutions, but they're not palatable to either party at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so it's insoluble then. <laughs> mm. At the moment, soluble. it would appear that way. Do um, you have a view on that? Yeah, as far as the deep sea market is concerned, we're out of step with the domestic market. Scotland is a net exporter, unlike the rest of the UK, who import more than export. But Scotland is a net exporter. If you look at a train out of Cope Bridge, 99% of these containers in that train will be fully loaded. Exports going to the rest of the world. The inbound trains will maybe convey around 40%. You know, so it's a massive imbalance. That gives Scottish industry and Scottish exporters a major headache because they they have they struggle to make enough empties. And you will hear Diageo and Edrington and various others saying there's not enough empties, there's not enough flow of empties into Scotland. And by and large, that's because if a deep sea vessel lands from China at Felixstowe, Southampton, most of the cargo in there goes up to the Midlands, and it will be the, the container will be emptied in the Midlands at Crick, Daventry, warehouses, Andrews Place, Ken's Place, and then it'll be stored there. And the empty deep sea container will then go back to the port and be shipped back out to China or Australia. Ken or Andrew's containers then bring those goods up to Scotland to the RDC. But of course, we don't have the empty. So you have a continual situation, a continual cycle, especially in the busy periods, whereby we, 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 the feed of empties up to Scotland is critical for the whisky industry. And Freightliner, our trains out of Cote Bridge probably move about 20% of the deep sea exports out of Scotland. The rest are moved by coastal feeder out of Grangemouth and Greenock. So there's a huge, huge demand for empties, especially at a particular time of the year. And it really gets pretty desperate. So yes, we have tried to crack this nut. And I don't know many meetings I've sat at with various people. But I think part of the problem is when it comes to deep sea containers in particular, they're global markets. And because the organisations are so huge, there's one part of the organisation 
looking after the global supply of containers, another part of the organisation doing the ops, and to try and get someone to say, you know, marry this up because there's containers needed in Scotland. Can we get them there? No, that's not going to happen because, the, you know, there might be containers needed in Los Angeles or containers needed in Taipei. And that will take priority. So it's a very difficult... It's not something we're going to crack here locally, ever. You know, but uh, as Ken said, if we could get licence to get the people who are moving goods through the UK to share each other's containers, that would be that would be good. But it's it's a big ask. On, on the commodity side, in terms of different products that may be um, interesting for future growth and rail. Um, at the moment, we both concentrate on ambient food and drink products, mainly fast-moving consumer goods. Um, and th there, there is a huge demand to try and get chilled and frozen on rail as well. Um, there's apprehensions, um, because especially in chilled, because there's a big implication if there's a delay. Um, but um, in terms of the service levels that we now are being able to provide that apprehension to beginning to get broken down and we've now got some children frozen running on air trains but it's a very small percentage of the total volume um, but it is a huge opportunity for further growth on the domestic intermodal market the big issue for that in terms of moving forward is that in terms of Scotland you can get these the equipment into Grangemouth, Moss End, Coatbridge without a problem, but you can't get it further north because it's 2.6 metres wide for a reefer box, um, mainly. Most, the, the mass production units are 2.6 metres wide, so that restricts where we can go to. We can't go to Inverness with a 2.6 metre wide box at the moment. Um, so, you know, we need to look at the economics of, does it justify changing the gauge to be able to carry it, or is it better to look at a 2.55 metre wide insulated box that would cost you a bit more to buy because it's more bespoke, but it will, pro it will probably be cheaper than changing the gauge to Inverness. But that bit of work hasn't been done yet. One thing I should say, in deep sea terms, we move a lot of frozen goods. We move a lot of frozen fish from Scotland over to markets in China. Far East, Spain, etc. That's been happening for many years, and they are refrigerated boxes, but they are deep sea containers. Therefore, they're different profile from from Kenneth's. Yeah. And we also move ambient. Uh, there's a lot of seed potato traffic out of Scotland, particularly before Christmas. Uh, we can move something like 80 containers a week in our trains, seed potato, and they move by rail because it's faster than than coastal feeder. And those are moved in, in ambient boxes. So it, it's, it's a well-established market in deep, tea, deep sea terms because all of the ports have refrigeration plug-in points, as we do in rail terminals. And also, the, obviously, the, the big deep sea ships have refrigerated plug-in points. And these goods, I mean, if there's a disaster, say, and something stuck in a train, most of the times the, the, the charge, the refrigeration will last for around 72 hours. You know, and a lot of them have just generator sets that you can top up with oils. They'll continue to run like a domestic fridge, so there's not an issue there. But I think probably the, the maybe the supermarket circuit they, they're not so au fait with that, and it's it's education and getting people comfortable with it, and that they're getting there. It's good news that Ken's already, and Andrew no doubt already moving these things. We'll Covered a lot of the next question I was going to ask as well, and that is that, of course, the, there's a perceived change in demand for freight on the rails. We're seeing things like coal becoming less significant uh, as time goes by, simply because we're mining and using less coal. But what actions do we need to take uh, with the Scottish Rail Network to prepare us for the next generation of rail cargo as things change? Other than what we've said already about mm -hmm. container standardisation. Yeah. I suppose really enhancing the rail network is, is both... Um, Andrew and Ken have said, we have a real issue if the West Coast Main Line's closed. We can lose trains for three days, four days. That would never happen in a motorway. You would always have another outlet. So the East Coast Main Line clearance is crucial, but that is underway. I mean, Network Rail are working to that. Um, but I suppose as rail freight grows um, and as the world market grows, if European traffic grows, their boxes are pretty odd sizes. So it's not something you can say, right, that's it, we've done it, tick in the box. There has to be a continuous improvement. And I think as far as Scotland's concerned, uh, you know, as Kenneth says, from the central belt south 
to Daventry and to the Midlands were not bad. I mean, it's not great, but it's not bad. But once you start to head north from the Central Belt, that's that's less. And of course, there's a lack of terminals up in probably the Inverness area. Elgin, you know, so we, we could do with some improvements up there. I think gauge, differential in gauge is an issue. If you look at Aberdeen, Inverness, which are probably your two larger populated areas outside the central belt, um, Perth, Dundee, um, there's talks of possible terminals for Perth and Dundee. Um, I, personally, I struggle with that because um, you know the economics of rail against road on that route will be very challenging for a rail operator. The, the, the places that it makes most sense to use rail in Scotland are the places you can't get a standard container to. Yeah, I know. Um, the, the, um, the other aspect is making sure that um, we retain the capacity for freight on the rail. Um, you know, and what we don't want is that the demise of coal suddenly appears into a passenger capacity rather than a freight capacity, because we are seeing growth in domestic and deep sea intermodal traffic in the UK um, that is accelerating and, and, well, did for a period surpass coal. It's back behind it at the moment, but it will come back again, um, just with the movement in coal volumes up and down. Um, so, you know, we are seeing growth on that side, and it is certainly, in terms of the next 20 years, the one sector in the rail freight market that has the most potential, I believe, in growth is the domestic intermodal market. Um, you know, I mean, between us, we're doing roughly 200 loads a day north on rail, um, and we're scratching at the market. So there's a huge opportunity, um, and we are we're seeing a major change in the way large organisations are procuring their logistic solutions. Um, they definitely are asking more questions about the carbon footprint of the solution. They're not saying they want to pay any more money for it, but um, you know, if you can match their price expectation with a rail solution against a road solution, they'll generally choose the rail solution now. And that's a big change from where we were. I think for me... Um I know it's in the plan now, the electrification of the Grangemouth path. Um, obviously, electric rail is the most efficient and effective way to move volume. Um, we have that into Moss End, we have that into Cote Bridge, but we still have to do a change at Moss End to get it out to Grangemouth. And uh, obviously, Grangemouth, one of the biggest retailers in the UK, one of the big four, is based there. Um, that's where we run the, the 70 service to. So further electrification of the, the services would be number one. Um, I think we'd like to see probably a more formal rail freight strategy of what's going to happen over the next five five years plus. You know, we'll be engaging more with that, that we're actually trying to put ideas... I think it's fair to say, in a very traditional business, we're always investing in the future and responding by the day. And we have to, we something have to have a view that this is what the market needs in five or ten years out. So I think a more formal rail freight strategy would be very good to sit down and really see what the plan for the next three to five years or even beyond, because, you know, it starts today for what we want to deliver in five years' time. We're talking about no like the container where we're on the market and there. I think we do cabotage a number of import containers, but again, customers look for a discount because they can't get the cube on. So again, it's how we can continue to make sure that the, the freight grants, what grants are available, can help support you know, keeping stuff on the road. Because at the end of the day, you've got hauliers in the land who will run out of Scotland back down to the Midlands area for the cost of fuel. I'm up anyway, you just give me anything back. And that's your competitor you know, with, with rail uh, from that side. But we, we are doing more work with a number of our customers, come back to what Kay was saying with the, the imbalance of containers on the deep sea market, where a customer may have an import route, an export route, but the two don't meet when they get into other parts of the world. And we're now doing joined up thinking with some shipping lines that can give that third link, so the same container could be used for the three links. So again, it's quite innovative, but again, getting customers now to come to the table. I think there's, a, there's, a, there's more of a buy-in now from certain customers. They have to think outside the box, rather than just procure one route and not, not the other route. And I think also, in terms of moving forward, it is actually quite important to try and maintain close links between the deep sea and the domestic and the European markets in terms of the terminals we're going through. Because if you can have all focusing through the same terminal, it gives you synergies, it gives you benefits in terms of your overall um, volumes, because we have different peaks in the year. Deep sea markets for Christmas peak a lot earlier than the domestic and European market. So it helps in terms of balancing your um, flows. I concur with that. At Coatbridge, we have high fixed cost 
and until Kenneth and, and Andrew's trains came along, it was it was completely based on on freightliner volume, and again it's all deep sea, so everything was was coming through this huge crescendo. Now we have a domestic split, and it's very good because their vehicles arrive in the queue at a different time from the vehicles with the deep sea, and it just works. You know, it definitely works. But what it has driven us is for, instead of deep sea terms, a Monday to Friday site, we now work seven days because we're handling Kenneth's trains. You know, it's more. It always was twenty four five, but it's now twenty four seven, and that's good. And it is good to have a mix. It's good to have a mix of real hauliers in there, real operators in there. And I would always suggest that any site should be multi. Well, they are multi-user anyway, but that should be encouraged. The other thing, there is a big gap with coal. The traffic that will trans or needs to transfer to rail is is that that's still on road, or some of this traffic that's still on road. And there is still a perception in the haulage base that you have to be a really big guy, like Kenneth or Andrew, to use rail. No, you don't. Any of them can buy a slot in my train tonight, and some of them do. I've got three or four small road hauliers who buy individual slots on any given night in our trains. But there is a real kind of a myth out there about it's all very difficult. It's not. These are timetable daily services that run with spaces on them, and anyone can use them. You could use it if you want. You know, I mean, it's that simple. But there is this big myth, and we've talked about this, and how we... we we kill this stage, you know, and, and can of get more people encouraged onto it. We we had various hollies who would only use this when they were stuck. That's great, you know, when they get really busy and they can't do that overnight trunk, they'll book a slot with us. But the night they can do it, that's fine, because that makes use of their vehicle. But there's, there's options out there for people. And it annoys me this road v rail. When Freightliner started up, we, we probably are a road haulier who does the trunk haul by rail. We always wear... At one point, we had the biggest road fleet in the UK. We have still have our own road fleet, and customers can choose whether they, they just do as terminal to terminal or port to terminal, or whether they want us to do the onward delivery to Aberdeen once the box comes to Coke Bridge. That's their choice. We offer that service. In reality, probably we do about 20% of the haulage that comes through Coke Bridge. The rest done by third-party hauliers. And again, that's good because it spreads. When the peak comes, no single haulier could, could cope with that. And it spreads it. And Andrew and Ken and I know each other for years. We've worked together for years. They're my customers, you know, and I'm their customers at times. So there is a synergy there which needs to be recognised and sort of developed from that. Mr Russell, uh, in your opening remarks, spoke uh, extensively about the Channel Tunnel. So it's obviously taxing your mind at the moment. Is there freight going through the tax Channel Tunnel at all at the moment? We're doing about uh, 60 loads a week of whisky through the Channel Tunnel at the moment. Um, we do, um, uh, we're running about 30 loads a day in each direction um, through the tunnel, of which the southbound it, largest portion is the whisky. Um, the rest is a mix of various different products. What's the capacity for freight through the Channel Tunnel? Is it time limited? Is it an overnight thing? or is that... No. No. Um, the capacity for freight in the Channel Tunnel is still massive. Yeah. Um, the take-up has been small. Mm -hmm. um, the, the issue is whether you go via Kent and then you've got 24-hour, effectively a 24-hour opportunity to hit the Channel Tunnel. Mm -hmm. If you go HS1, you only have a limited window between 2300 hours and 05 in the morning, uh -huh. five nights a week and there is only five paths in each direction for freight on HS1. Yeah. So that, that's, that is a limiting factor. Um, but there's plenty of capacity to go through Kent and through the tunnel. So you, as I said, you've obviously been uh, addressing this issue. Do you feel that you're making progress? Are you going to succeed? Well, I think we are making progress. Our, our biggest challenge with the Channel Tunnel has been the economics of getting it to work against short sea. Um, and um, what we had to do was um, go for a European wagon rather than a UK wagon because it was half the price per day to use. Um, that meant we had to use HS1 because it's a wider wagon, um, which gave us benefits in speed, but a slightly increased cost. Um, so we can now do a rotation from Lille into barking and back in 24 hours mm -hmm. um, and the service is actually very attractive in terms of its operational capability um, price wise 
is a different struggle. But um, yeah. um, and wh where I'm frustrated is that if we'd used a UK wagon, we could have come through Kent and we wouldn't have had the fixed time criteria that we have because of the HS1 constraints. Um, but the the cost of the wagon just took it away as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and in the longer term, yep. what's HS2 going to do to the freight business? And um, I, I personally have a view that HS2 will add no value for freight. Mm -hmm. um, and if anything, will add a complication because of the congestion it's going to cause in the north of England when HS2 stops and they move on to the traditional network, mm -hmm. I think you're going to have more congestion pushed up towards Preston uh, area, which will then give us an issue in capacity for our freight. Okay. But by congestion, what do you mean? If there's Real. more passengers on HS2, then there'll be more passengers catching the train to go north? Yep, potentially. The the line. Potentially. Yeah. And that's my fear. Um, uh, HS2... There's all the talk about HS2 will take... Um, volume off the traditional network um, to high speed trains I, I, I don't see that I mean, all your, all your passenger rail operators are still going to want to offer their intercity services rather than just an HS2 solution um, so I don't think it will throw up a huge additional capacity for freight on the traditional network and longer term if you look 20-30 years away it actually doesn't do anything for the long term benefit of the gauge for freight so I actually think we need to look at um, a spine up the UK that has a European gauge capability for freight rather than necessarily look at um, how we can achieve other benefits for freight. Mm -hmm. Would that find agreement with... Um, I don't know. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's, a, it's a hard hard call to make. But I, I think what, what may happen is it could stunt future growth. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know whether today's freight would be catered for, but we're hoping to see today's freight increase, and of course it's forecast to increase. Mm -hmm. And that's the concern. They will build in capacity for the traffic levels we have today, plus probably a bit on top. But who knows? I mean, the freight business is notoriously fickle. You know, I mean, we, we set out plans uh, based on what a customer says, and that customer could disappear in two years' time. Well, that factory could disappear in two years' time. So it changes all the time. It's not all the passengers where you have some, you have a, a housing estate, and you know people are going to travel from work to there into the city. That's fine. That's that's kind of a okay. If you run a train from there to there, it's, it's likely it's going to run for the next hundred or so years while these houses are still standing. Freight's totally opposite of that. Would, it it would changes it be, in a whim. Would it be fair to say then that if we're talking about HS2 and all it can achieve, we're going to have to do something? quite deliberately to improve freight capacity, otherwise HS2 is not going to benefit the freight I think industry. so. Maybe, maybe a, a specific freight-only line, still allow freight access onto the other lines, but do something about a freight-only line because it, it could be a major issue coming or forward. Or a freight preference line. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So then also you look at the question, about, you know, we talk about the cost of rail. Or rail comes with a fixed cost, and when you get it right, it's very advantageous. When you get it wrong, it's very costly. Um, we have started now since, was it last year, Ken, they put up the, the, the charge for every minute that you're late onto the network? Yeah. So if, we, if we'd lay a, a train onto the network, I think it's 40p a minute. Um, what is that? 40p? 40 a minute, sorry. 40 pound a minute, sorry. It's 40 pounds a minute if we delay a train going onto the network. So we'll now dispatch a train partially loaded rather than fully loaded. But if we get delayed on the network, it's virtually impossible to get any form of compensation to get back through the supply chain back to your customer for delays. So again, freight is seen as the, the second best friend is not given any form of preference. Mm -hmm. So certain customers we've got, they all know, they all know the cut-off time to get the train ready, get it prepped, get it checked, safety checks and get it out, out of the gate. Now we, we can't knock it out of the gate. So a container gets delayed in the M6 on the way to, to Durft in only by five minutes. Sorry, he has to turn it around and then take it up the road because, again, we're not prepared to hold the train back for that, mm -hmm. that five minutes. So freight is penalised. Right, at the same time, so customers will not take the risk. So certain customers will, but it's not time sensitive. But more freight in the UK now moves very much in a time sensitive and a time window. So again, that takes away a degree of flexibility, you know, to yeah. enhance hold more on. Yeah. 
I mean, you have the situation whereby a train could be delayed coming into us because of no fault of any freight operator or ours. It could be a passenger delay causes a train into Coat Bridge three hours late. We therefore have to turn that train and get it out, you know, in its normal time slot. But it takes time to unload and reload a train, and I've watched trains get a coat bridge half half empty. When we were screaming for space because we had to because of the delay thing, you know, and that there's no leeway given, um, and that's an issue. And certainly, I think your trains were all held at Daventry. Yeah. They could have been moved up country, but it was a total ban on moving them. So the, there is this hierarchy within the railway whereby freight trains tend to get put to the back of the pile, you know, and that that's understandable. A passenger votes, freight doesn't vote. You know, but the, there has to be a realisation that we want the shelves filled in shops. You know, we, we can't we can't behave like that. It, there has to be some kind of a priority given. I think the Royal Mail trains get priority, but well, that, that, that's a good point. Kay. I mean, in, in in some countries, some some commodities will attract a different um, um, priority within the rail network, um, and uh, but in the UK, you've got nuclear and you've got Royal Mail that sit with a higher priority in terms of all freight. Um, the rest sits with a lower priority and I think we should have something where um, you know, we, we can, I mean for example if there's a major incident in the network, freight almost stops till they resolve the solution for a passenger and then freight will drip back in. And that, for, for, for the FMCG trains, that's a major problem. And certainly for port trains as well, in the, the, the back end of the year, we're really busy. What will happen is we'll have goods getting brought into Coat Bridge four or five days in advance because we, we're really stuck for space, you know, train space. We, we have a timetable service that we can't afford to throw another couple of trains in just because it's busy. So we work two vessel deadlines. So we're sitting with a ship at Felix Stowe is going to sail on a given day. We've got to get it in that final train. And, of course, if something like that happens, that's it. You know, you, you've missed your market. I've got Diageo on screaming. I've missed five boxes that were urgent for New York because we've missed this ship. So there is a real issue. They are time-sensitive. Not all the time, but there are occasions whereby it's critical these trains get through. And there should be maybe some way you could put some priority to say, look, this is a, really, this is a hot one. Can, can we get this one through the network? And that, that doesn't seem to happen at all, and it's very frustrating. Keep in mind as well, if one train is suspended from Durf to Scotland, it takes nearly 50 trucks equivalent to move those goods. And 50 trucks are not sitting out in the marketplace where they used to be going back five or ten years ago. So and that, that's me put into perspective. No, if, if I'm sitting with a train, and we run one train here dedicated every night for Asda. We'll, we'll, we'll deliver to stores in Aberdeen, ourselves in Ken, for Asda at Lutterworth. And you'll be lucky if the goods will probably do maybe 35, 40 miles in the public highway. Yeah. Yep. And that's tomorrow's goods on the shelves requirement. And that can take 50 trucks, if not more, to move that length if a train's, de if a train's delayed or suspended. Yeah. So it has a massive impact on the whole of the Scottish economy, how we, how we, how we handle that. Did you have a supplementary? No, it's fine. It's yeah, been covered, has it? Okay. In that case, uh, Adam, you have some questions? Yeah, thanks. My questions, um, some of them have already been answered by you, so we'll, I'll try and run through them fairly, fairly quickly. Um, the first, first question was in terms of the <coughs> capacity for expansion of Scottish rail, um, rail freight. Are there any particular parts of the, of the rail network in Scotland that are constraining, uh, would constrain future growth? I don't think um, I, I don't think we're sitting here right now with parts of the Scottish network that's constraining um, growth. Um, I think our issues for Scotland are probably more in England, um, in terms of where where our goods are trying to get to, or where our consumption is trying to come from. Um, the, the, it's fair to say that um, you know, I mean, if we take. One of our customers, Tesco, as an example, Tesco would love to have a rail terminal at their depot at, um, in the M8 corridor. Uh, that has an issue because of the amount of passenger traffic that's on that corridor. Um, so, you know, on, on, on specific instances, yes, I suppose we do have a potential blockage of what their desired aspiration is. Um, but in reality, you know, between Grangemouth and Coat Bridge and Moss End, you're almost servicing the M8 corridor as well as you could. Um, they would have a slight benefit if it was on their doorstep, uh, but 
Hey ho. <laughs> yeah, I think I would come to know if you look at know where we could open up more routes. More important for me is where we can get more volume and capacity on single trains. Yeah. I mean, again, we are the first ones to get restricted in length. We know we can run longer trains, but again, any any suggestion at all about delays, the train gets shortened. Then we talk about the capacity in the train. I mean, we we launched last year um, the 50 foot container. Um, that a few years ago they brought the government brought out a trial, right the so a trial to move from 13.6 curtain siders to 15.6. So we went from 24 pallet footprint to, to 26. Again, a disadvantage to rail because we were still very much stuck on the old 26. We have now brought out containers for the retail sector that can carry 30, which is great. So north we are bringing another four pallets, 15% more volume north, at zero increase in cost. So the benefit to both the retailer and also to ourselves. The cost in rail, 18 metre wagon, no disadvantage. But those containers now running south with one pallet less because they're slightly heavier. <laughs> so the retailers getting the benefit coming north. Yep, but there's a lot of spare capacity. I'm sure if Ken and I looked at our trains, you know, of weight on our trains per unit, there's a lot of spare capacity on the existing services we could get the benefit of if we can just get them to the to the rail service and also get the longer trains. That, that's an important one. The, the loops are too short. So we're restricted in, in, in length, especially daytime trains. We've had this uh, suggested to us that we should be looking in terms of transport corridors uh, rather than, say, just looking at dueling the A9, for example. We should be looking at the whole transport corridor uh, and looking at investing uh, in something like maybe longer loops uh, going north and that type of thing. Would you agree with that kind of uh, approach? I mean, our train to Inverness is restricted to 20 loads, yeah. whereas um, from... Glasgow to the Midlands, we're running up to 36 loads right. on the maximum size train. Right. Yeah, so the, the scale differential has a huge implication on the cost, right. the unit cost. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Convener. I, I was interested in the comments that Network Rail made to the Aberdeen business community re recently, which is basically make the case if you think there's more improvements necessary. And uh, Adam Ingham has rightly raised a couple of points I was going to raise about passing loops. But mm. if you particularly look at the North Service, which you've touched on, uh, which is uh, home to me, for example, the lack of uh, dueling of rail mm. is a huge problem. I believe there's also height restrictions which affect you, um, also the issue of electrification. I mean, what Network Rail, who I met last week, tell me that there is uh, still uh, ring-fenced funds which is available for bidding. Now, I'm not suggesting for a second convener that we can suddenly use that to electrify the line from Perth to Inverness. That's not, not going to happen. Um, there is a Scottish Government transport plan, there's a Network Rail plan, but what I was reassured about is there is still still funds available to put bids in. Uh, what would you see the priority for any extra bids uh, over the next control period to try and get some action to help uh, facilitate more freight movements, particularly north, where there is restrictions? If, you, if we can get a longer train, the, 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 uh, what, we've, what I certainly do not agree with is trying to suggest that rail is given a bad turn because you're going to dual the A9 or you've increased the speed in the A9. Rail's got to stand up and be innovative itself and not to the detriment of another mode. Um, so all modes need a free market to be able to do the best they can within the playing field they're in. I, I mean, I generally agree with that to your convener, although the point I would make is you're effectively uh, comparing in the A9 route um, a, a dual route with a single track road, if you take the rail equivalent. Yeah. So I'm quite, I'm quite happy to see equal... Uh, competition, but the problem is it's not equal because the structure, infrastructure is totally different. And if you want to encourage, I know I'm preaching to the converted with the uh, three witnesses here today, but if you want to encourage people to make choices, not just freight, but also passengers to say, I want to use rail rather than road, if you're comparing a jeweled uh, road with a single track one, people are going to vote with their feet and still take the car. So I've got a general, I'm sure you probably agree with that statement. Well, but I, in principle, I do agree with it, but um, equally, I, I, as a business, you've always got to justify any expenditure you're doing. Um, so, you know, just to say it's someone's right to have access to a dual carriageway or a dual rail, rail route, mm -hmm. if it can't be justified because of future use, then you've got to find different solutions that achieve the, the end game. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that's sections of dueling rather than the whole route or whether it's longer loops can achieve it, I, I, I'm not sitting here with the answers, mm -hmm. but we need to explore because... 
to, to duel the whole way would be a phenomenal cost, mm. as it is on roads. Um, so. I'll, I'll um, perhaps leave it at that, convener. I know you're pressed for time. Okay, uh, thanks, convener. Um, you've already, uh, the panel's already discussed the uh, issue of loading gauge restrictions. Um, mostly down south, uh, or the, the, the sort of uh, changeover from European to, to UK. Uh, is there anything you would want to add to that? Particular restrictions in Scotland, for example, that might be addressed? Um, or anything you want to add to the, the loading gauge restriction uh, point? Personally, my view is that if we, if, if we need an alternative route for freight that um, to, to achieve the capacity issues moving forward for the next 20, 30 years, then we should actually look at a route for freight that is capable of better gauge. Um, there's no point doing it unless you do do it right. Um, and so I would, I would be voting for a central Scotland down to access to the channel tunnel on a European gauge capability. But I don't expect that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Ken's talking about the gauge for actually running, running the actual train on itself. Yeah. I would probably focus more on the actual gauge height restrictions for the containers. Um, I have a good example just now. We, we talked about ASDA a few minutes ago. I mean, we can run ASDA from Mutterworth on a 9-foot-6 container. We've got to put an 8-foot-9 container to go to Aberdeen. Yeah. And the idea is the same container should go into Grangemouth, DC, and come back out with Aberdeen on it. So you yep. have to go into yep. things. Yep. Like yeah. And it's a problem we've got. I mean, about nine foot six also can't go up the East Coast right. line either. It can only come up the West Coast main line. Right. So again, trying to get a standardisation of gauge height allows more flexibility with the boxes. Again, give customers more flexibility on the load fill, right. and then it makes it more seamless. Okay. There was money, I mean, a long time ago I was involved in a group in Aberdeen, and because um, we were running nine foot six boxes were becoming more of an issue, was that we have to get the gauge increased to Aberdeen. We were looking for W10, which will take a nine foot six box and a standard height bed wagon. And the costs that were coming out were horrendous, absolutely horrendous. So the, the container gauge at that point wasn't even up to W8. You couldn't even get an eight foot six because over the years tracks had been built up and we'd lost that despite the fact we had it years ago. And when they looked at the cost, as well, there's another way we can, we can get special low bed height. Well, rail wagons, can we get FFG? You know, if, if Mohammed won't come to the mountain, can we get the money to build these special rail wagons? And that would go in as a pool for any operator to use. And that was the way the thing was progressing. And then it was taken over by, I don't know who, which, which group took it over, but that part dropped out the equation. And the special, the need for the special rail wagons was kind of lost. And they went ahead and they increased the route. But we were still in this bind whereby you still need a specific set of rail wagons. And they're a huge cost. And they've got a 30-year lifespan. You know, so, and, you know, at that point, it was chicken and egg. Now, you move megas and you can move them with 9 foot 6. But a freight liner, 60 foot platform, no, we couldn't do it. You know, we'd have to use one of our low liners. And uh, whether that could something, I know freight facilities grants, I don't think they, they could apply to that, but that would be a solution. Rather than having to, you know, raise the, the tunnels and raise the bridges, get these these for any use, you know, for you. If you're moving containers in that, in that route or trains in that route, you have access to this rail wagon. So, if you like, looking for grant assistance for the for the, the equipment as opposed to the infrastructure. Aye, looking for a common pool rather than, than going to huge... Because I think, you know, some of the costs that were coming out from Network Rail to get the route to W10 were huge. Yeah. And you have to look at the justification for that. Is there sufficient business that's going to move by rail up there to justify that? There may well be in the future, but at that point there wasn't. But they're certainly buying the special low-bed rail wagons and putting them into a common pool for any operator to use who's trafficking that. If Ken wants to use them or I want to use them or Andrew wants to use them, they're there for general use. Okay. And that's something that's that a, maybe a better option. That's something that could maybe sit in the same way that um, the, the ships were dealt with for um, um, passenger, for ferry services. Right. Um, because what you want is something that's commonly available to all the operators from a central pool, rather than necessarily each operator having to invest and therefore not getting the utilisation. Okay. Well, 
well, that's an interesting observation we'll consider, obviously, uh, for our final report. In terms of, um, we talked about <coughs> freight facilities and rail terminals are, are another. Um, we visited some as a committee and are probably going to visit some more. Um, does the ind industry have sufficient rail terminal capacity to handle our, um, our freight business? Personally, my view is um, we probably have enough rail terminals. You might say there's the odd geographic area that could maybe justify something, but we've got enough rail terminals, but the rail terminals need some help to increase their capacity. Okay. So the infrastructure within the terminal right. um, could do with getting changed in order to enhance what the terminal's capable of. The footprint's fine. The infrastructure inside's just not quite right for what we're needing now. So what's lacking? Well, I mean, if we take Coke Bridge as an example, um, they're, they're working with 50-year-old uh, cranes. 45, 45. Sorry, sorry, Kate. <laughs> um, which have got limited span and um, capability. Um, so an, an investment to put larger, more modern cranes in would increase their capability tremendously. So what's holding you back from doing that? The cost. The cost and the difficulty in our market is that we don't get business commitment. The trains that run out of Coke Bridge are bought daily by customers on a slot basis and there are no customers who will say we will buy a slot from you every day. So our business peaks and troughs. We run daily timetable trains and some days they run out half empty, some days they're overflowing and in order to make a commitment to spend, you need to know your business is going to be there. If you look at our market in England, 60% of our trains are contracted. Shipping lines buy 60% of the trains, whether they put a box on there or not. They have that certainty. In Scotland, no customer will commit on a contract basis. So we have a situation where today trains are full and for the next three weeks they could be empty. So you cannot build a business case on that. It's frustrating and Freightliner, as a group, have always had a very strong interest in Scotland. And despite the fact that our trains run at the margin a lot of the time, because, again, onto the container situation, because we're bringing very little from the south. If you look at our train to Southampton, it's, it's oversubscribed. But coming from Southampton, there's 60% space on it, because people aren't sending empty boxes to Scotland. And there's a constant issue, you know, and some of our trains at times struggle to make a margin. And as a business manager in Scotland, I've had to fight hard to keep trains in Scotland. But fortunately, Freightliner feels Scotland's a very important market and want to stick in there. But do they have the money to revamp Coat Bridge without someone saying we will guarantee you business? No. I think, I think if you came to uh, Transport Scotland with a case for a new terminal, mm -hmm. it's an easier process than going with a case to enhance a current terminal. Okay. I mean, what you already have in Coke Bridge, is a, so you, so a couple have been around it, it's a cracking site. It's a big site which, with minimal spend in real terms, could double its capacity overnight. I mean, you could really transform it. It's in a great location. As far as rail connectivity goes, you don't get any better. We did look at, prior to Hatfield, Coke Bridge volumes were growing, and we looked to relocate it. And we were all over the the central belt, could you find a place to relocate Coke Bridge? Damn hard. The only one that was possible was we, we looked at the Clyde's Mill um, Steelworks out at the end of the now M74, yeah. and that would have been potential for us. And I think Kilgarth we looked at, that was another potential. But it's very difficult to find something. We're within two miles of three motorways. In real terms, it's fantastic. The footprint is large. We're in the right area. We're close to Edinburgh, we're close to Glasgow. It doesn't really get any better location-wise. So it, it's not an easy thing to do. But, you know, as, as Ken said, it's easier to build a new terminal than enhance what you have. And I would just say to the committee, please look, first of all, at upgrading what we have. We've got a decent amount of real terms between us. But with a tweak, you could you could enhance that and, and probably meet the next generation. And then from there on, if you need further capacity, then we'll look at building new. So what's the scale of investment you're talking about then? 
off the top of my head, probably about £8 million, pounds, I would have thought. I don't know. I don't know. But looking at when we've recraned our other terminals in the system who have committed volume, that's the kind of price. Yeah, I think yeah. support, no, the, the terminal infrastructure we have in Scotland does work. But uh, right to say, terminals are expensive to operate, expensive to run. But we should also at one stage further also about you know, making our ports more rail friendly as well. I think there's opportunities to move more freight physically into the ports by rail and limit that completely. Um, it's fair to say that, you no, know, not trying to you know, talk bad of our friends at fourth ports, but certainly when you go into the peak trading, the road haul agency now starts to charge all the customers a premium for delays at fourth ports because the site is just too congested, what they're trying to put through. Um, we ran successfully a rail service into there for a few years, but the train didn't quite take it to where they wanted it to go. So they started to charge us for the train to enter the port. So that made the job not effective. So again, just went back to road. So it's got, it's got that fine balance. But I think we should look at no connectivity with the, the ports as well. Even, even short haul rail can work yep. if you actually manage the asset base properly. But really, the train should actually be going straight to the berth rather than going to a, a stopping point in, just inside the gate. We had the, obviously the port authorities in last week, and it got the impression to some extent that um, there was a bit of competition between rail freight and, and, and the ports, which didn't really sound very um, helpful uh, to us. Uh, the, the, there seemed to be a lack of uh, a lack of cooperation, sh shall I put it that way, between port authorities and rail freight operators. So why, why is that the case? I understand that. For, uh, I think there's more export freight heading south to catch a boat than going through the ports in Scotland. Mm. And, it, and it partly is just the time congestion at the, the ports. Mm. Okay. I mean, as, as far as freight line is concerned, our, our entire business model is built on relationships with ports. That's what we do. We, we connect rail ports to inland UK. Um, the only the competition we have in Scotland, um, Freightliner does not compete with the road in Scotland because of the distances we run, it would be nonsensical to run the road vehicle. Our competition is coastal feeder, coastal shipping, which runs out of Grangemouth. So the vessels go from there over to Rotterdam and Antwerp. Um, so the competition there would be, would we put a, would Diageo put a, a whisky container into the port of Grangemouth to go on a ship there and sail across to Rotterdam and Antwerp to meet the big deep sea vessel, or would you take it to Colt Bridge and put it in a train to go to Felixstowe to meet the deep, deep sea vessel? Now, obviously, my preference is a train to Felixstowe, but 80% of the market go the other way because of cost. We cannot compete. It's an unfair market. They have funding we don't have, and the major shipping lines, um, they, it suits them to get vessels. They, they can less calls to the UK if everything ferries over to Rotterdam to them. So, to me, it's bad for UK PLC. And whilst I, I always... We need ports, we need Grangemouth, we need feeder services, but I think the balance is out. But that, that is competition, uh, and that might be what they're referring to, that they're competition with Freightliner for deep-sea exports. But it's not really... They, they don't operate the feeder ships, but they obviously service them, you know, so that's a competition you may have heard of. Um, and, and we also, you, you made the point early on about the fact that our terminals, uh, rail terminals, the problem is more about um, the road network round about them. And that's a similar message we've got from ports as well. The, the last mile they talk about in terms of um, the, the, uh, the run into the, into the ports. So you think we should be focusing there in terms of the road networks round about the terminals as a, as a, a, a choke point, if you like, in the in the whole your whole business. Yeah. Certainly for Coke Bridge, you round about 600 lorry movements a day right. in and out of our site, and we're two miles from the nearest motorway, so you're going through a town, basically, and Kenneth's vehicles and our vehicles between them round about 600 a day. A lot of movement to one site, and the roads, I mean, the response we've had so far is uh, North Lanarkshire Council tried to shut us down. And then at one point they suggested building a road out from the back of the terminal, as turning our site round and building a road direct to the M73. Great, we thought, except they wanted us to pay for it. <laughs> £6 million, thank you. No, sorry. 
we have a terminal, we have a road access, and in fact, um, before we were privatised, we spent £250,000 building a new access road into the terminal to mitigate the effects of our vehicles on Gartsherry Road. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's crazy. And Grangemouth, I think there's been some upgrades to Grangemouth Roads in recent years. Scottish Whiskey Market, the majority of Scottish Whiskey basically is bottled in the West. And again, the majority of Scottish whisky, probably 60% plus, will be exported from the east. And that whole M80 corridor is just a nightmare. Now, we before, before know about the Avon Gorge. No investment in Avon Gorge to get an alternative route to get to Grangemouth. Again, OK, just now with the new house interchange, you wouldn't pick the Avon Gorge down the M8. But again, things like that, how, how can we get to Grangemouth? Because the new road network is actually not bagged into the port, port now. But there's a, quite a gridlock now, you know, if you take down the Denny part of the country. There's a, a seized gridlock there with the volume of traffic trying to you know, do, that, do that route. But this is where, this is where I say road, and, road, rail and docks, that we all have to come with the same strategy. Yeah. You know, we want to make the whole business more efficient, more effective. Yeah. And principally our objective of every customer is how can we reduce the unit cost to get to the end market? Yeah. Well, this, this has been raised with us uh, by previous witnesses as well, so <laughs> I'll feature no doubt in our report to convener. All right. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify, um, Ms. Bowles, you're talking about the competition uh, between um, Freightliner and Rotterdam. Uh, what are you saying is that the, the, you aren't able to compete on price, but you are able to compete on speed and quality? Is that we, our traffic, the, the traffic we get on our trains is the VIP traffic. We compete. We are, in simple terms, if you are Diageo and you have a box to move to Shanghai, and a very important load for Shanghai. If you put it in a train out of Coatbridge, it'll be in Felixstowe the next day or Southampton or wherever it's sailing from, and it'll be on the ship. That's it. Job done. It's on the ship. You've got that certainty. If you put the container onto a coastal feeder out of um, Grangemouth, it'll sail across to Rotterdam. It's quite a small ship, obviously. Um, it'll sit there sometimes for a couple of days because of weather or because there's a bigger ship getting handled. Eventually, it's taken into the port, and that container, the, the containers are discharged from it and put in a holding area. At that point, the containers then have to move sometimes 20 odd miles across the port to get onto the ship. So there's umpteen different links in that chain where things can go wrong. Therefore, it's not so sure. Um, however, it suits the shipping lines um, for a lot of cargo to be fed to them to Rotterdam because it means they have to make less UK calls. Therefore, they will they subsidise the feeders to a certain extent. Obviously, it's a sustainable mode of traffic, see, so they get EU funding, Marco Polo funding, etc. So we, we cannot compete in any way, shape or form. So any business we do get is quality of service related. Costs probably about 150 to, I don't know, it depends who, who you are and who you're dealing with, but £150, roughly cheaper than putting it in rail to put it across to Rotterdam. And they've always existed, feeders have always been there, and up until um, Hatfield, rail had a very, very healthy share of the market. We had, post prior to Hatfield, our volume, deep sea volume through Coatbridge, bearing in mind in real terms, deep sea volume has grown big, a percentage since that, but in those those days, 1999, I think we had 116,000 deep sea boxes going through Coatbridge. That dropped post Hatfield uh, after the October 2000 or 2001, whenever it was. That that dropped to 46,000 pound. Huge share we lost. The reason for that was we had to uh, reduce our train offering because Hatfield, with speed restrictions in the network, then therefore instead of one train to do a one train and one train driver to do a, a run, it was taking maybe two or three. We had to cut our train services. And the Hatfield debacle really went on from the October until the April, and business started to leach away. And what happened was the market, the whisky industry, started to produce three or four days ahead of where they used to produce to meet their market so as it could catch feeder and be rooted with feeder. And once you've had a sea change like that, it's very, very difficult to come back. A customer, you know, a passenger will say, trains look no bad today. They're started to run again. I won't bother taking the train. I won't bother taking the bus or the car. I'll go by train. In business, that never happens. Once once that, that change has been made. But they do, the, the industry in Scotland realise that we're important to them. 
and they continue to keep us and continue to thank, uh, thank the supporters. And really, the spirits industry have been the backbone of our site for a long time. What really saved us uh, from going under was, was probably domestic trains, Ken's and, and Andrew's trains coming in because the terminal at Coke Bridge is very high fixed cost and any, any location like that needs volume to survive and that brought more volume in. And I'm pleased to say from 116,000 down to 40,000, this year we'll do almost 90,000. So we're on the way back and that's great. But in order to, we will come to a ceiling then and we'll maybe start to struggle if someone wants to move more volume. That's why an upgrade to Coke Bridge is pretty critical, you know, because that would, I know Ken's got other trains, probably Andrew has in the pipeline, as do Freightliner. And there'll come a point where we think, oh, that's us, you know. So for a very small spend, I reckon that, that site could be transformed and you'd double the capacity. In terms of the competitiveness of Freightliner's offer, if you were to have the level of investment that you have um, indicated would be necessary, what would be the implications of that? Would you be able to increase capacity? Would you be able to lower the cost, the cost to the and customer? Yeah, well, uh, you could have a slicker operation. We, we, at the moment, because of the layout and the, the infrastructure of the terminal, we've got to handle con every container three times because we don't have sufficient space under the mainline cranes to store. So what happens when we're emptying a train, we put it onto a road vehicle, the road vehicle takes it around to another part of the terminal that's put into storage. So that's a lift you're not having to do. That lies in storage, then another lift to get it back out. You, so we, you would cut that. The costs of the terminal, the operation would be cut. We also have um, two separate rail areas, one where we manage Ken's trains, one where we manage our trains. And in order to get trains out of one area, you've got to move it into another. That means you therefore need space in that other one. So it would mean we could increase capacity. If you increase the capacity, you can, you can cut the cost. But in real terms, rail costs have come down. When I started with Freightliner, it was 1982. The cost for moving, the price that we quoted to a customer for moving a container from Glasgow to London was around about £20 more than we quote today for a container from Coke Bridge to Felixstowe. So in real terms, our costs have come down massively. And we've put huge investment into the network. And we really have, you know, and we've tried to compete with feeder. We're as lean as we can be, but there's a limit because the trains that run out of Coke Bridge will run day in, daily. If they were full every day, both back and forward, our prices could go down. The unit costs would go down, but they're not. A lot of time there's spaces on them and we just don't get commitment. The heavy haul market with our, our um, bulk division, that's a different animal entirely. Customers commit, you know, a coal customer or network rail will give them a contract for three or four years and said, fine, that allows them to go out and invest in assets. But in the intermodal business, especially in Scotland, <coughs> no. Traffic's here today and going tomorrow. I just wanted to ask you about the, the barriers to unlocking the investment, because clearly Freightliner have not been able to make the the £8 million pounds investment at Freightliner, although mm -hmm. I, just, I think you've invested in other parts of the business and other locations in, mm -hmm. in the UK. There are obviously reasons for that, mm -hmm. but what, what are those barriers and how can they be overcome? The barriers, the barriers as far as our, our investment, I mean, we're, we have bought new mobile cranes for Coke Bridge. I mean, as, as, as equipment becomes life expired, we will renew it. But there's a real step change needed, which is a big investment. And uh, the terminal's working just now. It's working, it's coping at the moment. But, uh, you know, we could do with an upgrade in order to advance. Um, the barrier in Scotland is, is the fact that no business would commit to us. They will not. We can't go to the, the, the board with a business case to say, can you spend money in this? Where's my return? We don't know because no one will tell us when they're going to give us, whether they're going to continue to give us business. And that's a Scottish issue. We looked at FFG funding uh, for the terminal. And it's not possible because we're a multi-user site. We have no customers who are going to sign a bit of paper and say, yes, if you do this, we will, we will continue. We will, we will tell you we'll give you X amount of boxes a day. In some ways, it was easier for Kenneth and Andrew. Andrew could go and say, I've got 25 trucks a night going from Scotland to the Midlands. If you give me investment, I'll put them in a the train. And to do it, I need this. The sensitive lorry mile for, uh, formula works out. It stacks up. Coke Bridge is an established railhead already with 200 customers. There is no way in this earth I can make a case for it. And I've got to pay tribute to the Scottish executive 
um, the, the freight grants, Ian Farmer, etc., did what they could to try and help us and assist it, and we looked at all ways that we could unlock this funding, but we kept coming across barriers because it just wasn't possible under the rules. So something to assist, and I think there's a real problem with freight grant take-up just now. I don't think it's the same issue, but there must be problems that you know you guys are facing as well whenever you try to do something, so I'll let you win on that. The problem with take-up is that there's no schemes coming forward. I think there's two schemes that there, that may come forward this year. Uh, well, I know one will, and I'm told there's another one. Um, but they, they just haven't had the applications through that met the criteria to allow them to progress. But I think in terms of the m more important point is it's not so much the cost in the terminal, but the cost for us using the terminal um, is, is impacted at the moment because... At certain times of the day, we're bringing loads back for one of our trains. The terminal's sick and full, so we've got to bring the load into our own place, and then later in the day, when capacity's feed up a bit, take it back to the rail terminal. Um, so it has a big cost implication on us, the way it's currently working. So if we could increase the capacity, it would help the overall cost, not necessarily just the cost within the terminal. Okay. And I think hauliers in Scotland generally will have the same issue where you know, you're having to hold equipment for a specific train until you've got the window of opportunity to deliver for that train. I think it's fair to say the road transport of the UK as a whole, we don't, we, we don't run a cost plus model. The, no. market, the market rate dictates the rate for the job. Your cost management dictates you make a margin or you lose a margin. Correct. So you've got, you've got a very fine balance there you know, of servicing the customer's needs and expectations and also then make sure you can make a margin at the end of it as well. So it's all working together to try and get this cost control right. Because it's not a question that we can take out you know, some money in respect out of no case, no cost. Will that be a benefit to us and to the customer? It might just make the job finally go into a bit of a profit for all parties rather than a loss. James. Well, uh, I'm going to ask some questions about the relationship between port and rail, which have already some of it's been asked and some of it's been answered. But I wonder if you could give, if you have any more to say about the provision of rail facilities to and from the Scottish ports, as well as access between the quay and the railhead, which somebody mentioned earlier on. I think it was you, Mr Malcolm. Uh, do these provisions limit your ability to increase the use of rail to transport freight to and from the ports? And what action should be taken to resolve this issue? Well, we've been engaged quite strongly the last few years with the uh, fourth ports. Um, <coughs> fundamentally, we recommended they should go for a grant to extend the rail siding on the port right down to Quayside. Um, we, we ran the shortest train, I think probably in Europe. It was 42 miles from Limwood in the west right into the port. Um, and one, one of the options that we were trying to market at that time, uh, we couldn't get a lot of buy-in from fourth ports than it was, was the question that we should really become an inland terminal. We are consolidating loads, for instance, Limwood, and sending a train right through to the quay to go right onto the boat. But the train would have to go right to the boat. Yep, and that would fundamentally you know, take a lot of cost out of the whole supply chain. Um, we, we, put, we, we put the train on board and the train wasn't a profit maker for Malcolm's. The loss was less doing it by rail than it was doing it by road because at that time you had the Castle Carey issues, Grangemouth issues, the Kingston Bruce issues. It took a lorry virtually, no, about five hours to go to Grangemouth and back. Yeah. Yeah? Where well, you were sending a train in, with, if you're lucky, you had 40 boxes on it being 20s or you're only 20 standard. So that, that discussion took place. Um, it lost momentum as things changed and different priorities changed, and uh, it's still something we think a lot of scope for. Do, are you still in contact with them about this issue, or it's just went off the radar altogether? We, we, we tried for long and hard, and uh, eventually it became cost negative even more by putting a train in for the, the start to charge the access charge for train going in, right, so and it just it made the whole job not viable. Okay. So it all went back to road. Does anybody else have any? Well, Mr Russell, have you got any similar? And I agree with what Andrew said about Grangemouth because we were involved in the discussion with them as well. Um, they, they, um, and, and it would make a fundamental difference if they extended the line down to the quayside rather than the current terminal they've got. Equally, the current terminal they've got is very constrained, so it can only take a very small train, which adds complications as well. Um, but if you look at the other ports that we've got, you know, albeit Grangemouth will be the largest in terms of intermodal volume, um, Rosyth has got gauge constraints anyway um, to get in and out of. Greenock has got gauge constraints. So it's going to be very challenging to get them linked into the rail network for the current 
equipment type that is travelling because there's such a high percentage now. Um, nine foot six boxes, high boxes are becoming, um, they're over half of the percentage volume now, I would say. So that that's creating the problem for a scythe and um, Greenock. In years gone by, when I first started with Freightliner, we ran a train to Greenock every day with yeah. containers because you used to have, before the really deep sea vessels typically were around about 2,000 TEUs, you know, and obviously they've taken up an equivalent depth of water. Today's vessels, 18,000, 20,000, they're growing to, they're massive. You know, they take 14, 15 metres draft. So, and, but we used to run trains every day down to Greenock. But after um, the, the big deep sea operators decided they were moving, they were closing Greenock, and they were going to start all of their operations from the south of England, and uh, boats get bigger, etc. So the line fell into disuse. And there's a tunnel at Greenock. I think last time we spoke to Network Rail about potentially opening it, it was something like a million and a half to do the work to open this tunnel. But there's also, I think, housing being built over it, so it's probably a big ask to open that line again. But in the, the first, uh, when the, the move first happened, Scottish exporters obviously were not happy at this because they had lost a Scottish port access to deep sea. And in those days, shipping lines said, don't worry, we'll give an extra uh, subsidy to traffic from Scotland, which has got to travel down to Liverpool or Manchester, or not Manchester, Liverpool, or the Hull ports, or alternatively really deep sea ports, and they gave an extra, say, 80 or £70, pounds, which in those days was fine. All of that's lost now, so of course Scotland's got to transfer all that way. Now, I don't know what the capacity is of Greenock, whether they could take in a deep sea ship. I know Hunterson could, but I don't know whether Greenock could. But certainly a rail link to it would be difficult unless you did something completely new. Yeah. Uh, outside of, of the, the uh, having the line right to the quay, is there anything else that you would have that would be able to resolve some of the issues that you have? And it doesn't seem practical and certainly some of the smaller no, ones. Back onto rail. Yeah. I, think, I think it was back to investment in infrastructure at both ports. Mm. Yeah. Train length, train length would help, but on the quay would be. I think the, the same the thing. Right even result. a longer train going in, I mean, it runs into the empty container park. Yeah, exactly. Because they, they just they don't want it there. When you're taking a loaded train in, and ideally we're trying to get a loaded import boxes back out, yeah. so they've got the shuttle that goes on up and down, up and down the port. Okay. All right, uh, Ms. Walsh, you mentioned, I suppose, one of the, uh, an infrastructure obstacle in, in terms of uh, the, the Greenock key there, but. Uh, can you identify any other specific infrastructure obstacles to the free flow of freight by rail to Scottish ports? And if so, what improvements might remove these obstacles or deliver further benefits? Just echo what, what Kenneth and Andrew have said. We don't move trains to Scottish ports just now. We, we used to move to Greenock, and that's a his, historical thing. Yeah. Aberdeen was one. Um, we had, when I first started with Freightliner, we ran trains to Dundee and Aberdeen to the ports. And Aberdeen, obviously, they closed Guild Street. Um, which I thought was a backward step, to be honest. It's right across <coughs> the harbour. Although I believe the harbour now has Waterloo Yard. I think they've now got a rail facility connected to there. So I think possibly, you know, given the level of oil trade, and I see the prices going back up again, so it might not be dead in the water, but there's there's a lot of traffic moves up there. Uh, we move a lot of it by road. That should be in trains, you know, so I think a direct link to the Aberdeen Harbour would be, would be better and an enhanced link to there would be good. I don't know about anywhere else, indeed. Rosyth has always been talked about, and they do have a ferry there uh, and freight. But again, it's a, you can go to it, but it's, it's gauge restricted, so you'd have to use the special low bed wagons okay. that you would for Aberdeen as well. Because Rosyth's not where you really want to send a truck from the west to. No, mm -hmm. yeah, of course not. It's an, it's an ideal port for something that happens no, on the north side of the force. Mm -hmm. It's not an ideal port to run to if you're running no likes of spirit from the, from the west. One uh, further question I'd like to ask, it, and it was based on a comment you made earlier on, as well as about uh, the deep sea port. Would you like to expand on uh, the benefit of deep sea port? Deep sea port and Scotland would, um, would be pretty good as far as inward investment goes. You know, at the end of the day, if you're an international manufacturer looking to locate a plant, you're going to look at your transport, your cost to market. If you're a global exporter. How do I get my goods to market? 
If you are, are producing in Scotland, such as Diageo and Chivas and all these people do, they have to look at how they get it there. So they can either at the moment put it in a train from Coke Bridge or wherever, or Mossend possibly, down to one of the southern ports and get it in a deep sea vessel from there. Or they can take it to Grangemouth and put it over to Rotterdam and Antwerp and put it in a vessel from there. That all has costs. There was a scheme some years ago to uh, put a deep sea port at Hunterson. And I was quite interested in that. I thought it would be a good scheme. It would have given Scotland an international port. So it's a different scenario then whereby you've got to go to another country effectively to get your goods to market as opposed to running down the Isher coast. Job done. The other thing with the Hunterson scheme, which I think is now is gone, but the benefit of that was the, the I suppose the, the, the concept was at the moment the vessels come over from America, from the States, etc., South America, Canada, they hit the UK coastline, they go down the UK coastline through the English Channel and go to Rotterdam. Cargo's unloaded at Rotterdam, then it finds its way across on feeder vessels to Grangemouth or anywhere else in Europe. Similarly, Traffic coming from the Far East would come up through the English Channel, same story. The Hunterson scheme was based on the fact that the vessels would come over from the States and the vessels would come from the Far East. And the two of them would meet each other and swap cargo. So that vessel from the States would, would do all of its European cargo off here or Far East cargo and sail back over. And it was a scheme which was, was kind of fronted by uh, Clydeport at the time. They brought in a serious industry contender. And he had, he had interest there, so that was one part of it. The other part of it, you would have containers obviously landed on quay, as exactly in Felixstowe or Southampton, containers that landed there coming to Aberdeen. What you could have done in Hunterson was anything for the UK could have been offloaded at Hunterson, and you would have run it from Hunterson down to the northwest of England, down to the Midlands. Apparently something like 80% of what comes into Southampton goes north of Birmingham. Why is it coming into Southampton? Why is some stuff not coming in? And it would help this. And I always suggest that the UK is like a football field with a goalpost at one end. Why is everything going that way? It would have transformed the rail because we're all trying to funnel in. So what you would have had was maybe a shipping line choosing the, the, the UK hub or one of the UK stops anyway as Hunterson. So if one of their containers was loaded in another part of the country, it would come to Hunterson rather than go to Felixstowe or Southampton or Tilbury. Now, you might think the freight line and that's bad news, but it's not. It'd be good news for anyone, you know, I mean, because you'd have trains running both ways. Instead of this capacity funneling this way in the network, you'd have a, a much more balanced way of working. But the scheme's gone. And I think the other one that they were looking at, they were looking at a scheme up at Scapa Flow as well. And I believe that's still, I think Professor Alf Baird was... was fronting that one and that's probably still on the drawing board but it is something I think Scotland should be considering we, we export a huge amount of traffic to the rest of the world we are big big exporters and yet we don't have our own port and it seems it seems a bit odd that we're building and financing ports in Rotterdam and Antwerp and Zeebrugge to the detriment of UK ports and you know ultimately it'd be better if a Scottish port and that's me <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, my soapbox, but you know, I don't know. I don't know how Thank you very Andrew much. and Kenneth feel about this. But do any of the other witnesses have any comments to make on this? I think one of Hunterson was probably the only option for a deep sea port. Was rail would have to work because nobody in the right mind would run trucks up and down to Hunterson. Yeah. It just does not have a road network. Right. No, anywhere near it. We used to run the iron ore into Ravenscreek out there many years ago. <laughs> And uh, although there have been improvement and investment in the, the Ayrshire area, I wouldn't say there's improvement to the degree that you want to run volume of trucks, so it would have to work They had for a real. plan to do a three-towns bypass, a direct road link into it. I mean, that was part of the plan, you know, because it was recognised that the road access was dreadful. And initially it had to be real, and it was a staged, you know, it wasn't going you know, to be super-duper from day one, but it would be a staged development. I, I, I struggle with it personally. Um, I think uh, the, the issue around it is the triangulation of volume. Um, if you look at the UK consumption profile and what we consume in Scotland... Can you translate that for Triangulation of volume. Well, um, sorry. If you look at, uh, at where we consume our goods, it's predominantly um, for the UK. The, it's population-based. So if someone's bringing a load of toothpaste into the country, it goes into the Midlands. It then gets disseminated and Scotland will get a pallet. And the issue is they won't put a container of toothpaste into Scotland to service Middle England. 
Um, so I, 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 I don't see a fundamental way, change in the way people ship their trade around the world. And so Hunterston, while it would be attractive for Scottish exports and a few Scottish imports, um, I think the issue will be that you'll have too many empty legs. But the, the, main, the main focus of it, though, Kenneth, wasn't, wasn't goods landed here. It was this vessel yeah. interlinking. It was the swapping yeah. of containers yeah. between the two vessels, which would have taken out the need to and go around the English Channel. If the polar ice cap disappeared, then it might work. I think it's we've also now we've already the T-Sport playing a bigger part as well, mm -hmm. known freight in and out of Scotland. Absolutely. And Liverpool, Port of Liverpool, yeah. Seaforth is, is big, and they're looking to do probably what Hunterson was looking to do. So the key, I think the key from our point of view and from a logistics player would be is try and make our own existing facilities more effective, more efficient, before we start looking at how you actually open up something new. I think there's a lot of opportunities to improve what we've currently got. That's how we get that improvement, though, through the sustainable for the, the medium to long term. Yeah. I don't think we've got a consensus on that point, but... Thank you for your evidence, nonetheless. Okay, can we move on? Can I uh, just appeal to, to members to perhaps rationalise and condense their questions so that we can get through all of the, the issues we want to cover by the close of this session? Um, David, over to you. Yeah, thank you. I think some of my questions have been covered, so I'm sure I can uh, uh, listen to your, your comments earlier. Can I take the witnesses back to freight grant schemes? Uh, it's already been discussed, as, as you know. I mean, we all see the logic of them getting, f getting freight off road onto water and onto rail. Uh, you'll You'll know that we uh, raised this question with report colleagues last week. Um, I personally was quite surprised to find that there hadn't been a successful award for freight facilities grants since 2011. Although, in fairness, um, under the Waterborne Freight Grant, there was one of almost a million to Boyd Brothers at Corpac, which you'll be familiar about, and some examples under the Mode Shift Revenue Support Scheme. So, you know, why particularly is freight facilities grant clearly not working? What can we do to improve them? Because clearly it's in all our interests for climate change, for efficiency, uh, to have this working. Let's we'll start with Andrew. Yeah, I, I, mean, I think number one is we have had a lot of very strong support on grants since 2000, 2001, when we first started involved in rail. Um, so I compliment you know, all parties have been involved in that and delivering that. And I think also we brought a lot of very innovative ideas you know, to the table. Um, you've heard a common theme across here is this word commitment. Uh, in 2001, you found customers were being quite innovative and would commit to new ideas so we could come for a grant with the word commitment backed by our, by our suppliers, by our customers alike. A lot of areas we are needing to try and revisit again for some new grant, maybe new grant to support some existing grants we've already executed and used up. But there's a fine line by going for some additional grant support on something that's already had grant funding. Another question is, you no, know, is there an opportunity to get grants for actually retain something in rail rather than bring something to rail? Yeah? Um, I've raised this often with um, the, 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 the Transport Committee and a few times is, you no, know, we've got a few customers just now which we lost last year because of some disruption in our rail network and services as we changed suppliers. Uh, we won most of them back. Um, but like he says, you no, know, it takes years to get people onto rail. It doesn't take long to lose them. And we're in two modes just now. We think... There's limited opportunity to bring new volume to rail on doing more of the same. Um, I mentioned about trying to get heavier weights for intermodal traffic. I think that could sweep people to start using rail a bit more if they've got that advantage over road. Um, but likewise, we're currently doing an evaluation of our own customer base of ones we think could be exposed to moving off rail because, again, it's not sustainable in comparison with the cost for running by road and the flexibility as well. But certainly, I'm, I'm, we're very complimentary on the grants we've had to date. Um, I would also only admit we have maybe been a wee bit slow coming back with some new innovative ideas to bring new, new business to rail. Because we've been focused quite a lot in the last you know, probably two or three years of how we retain existing business on rail. We think that's more exposure at the moment than it is bringing new business. Um, I, I'd concur with what Andrew said. I, I would say, though, that the fundamental difference for us has been um, you know, we were getting three, five, seven-year contracts in the early 2000s. 2008-9, with the um, issues that appeared around the world, suddenly everything went to annual negotiations. And every customer we've got almost now negotiates every year and has done since 2008-9. Um, and that's fundamentally our problem in being able to provide a commitment for the grant um, 
So maybe, maybe we need to work and look at how we can overcome that problem um, in order to allow more grants to come back through the system. Um, I don't know whether that's an overcomable issue or not. Okay, well, mm. Similarly, because of the mechanism just now, it's impossible. We can't get customers to commit to the business they're currently moving right. with us. You know, if, if someone lands tomorrow and says, I want to run three more trains a day and I'll put them into Colt Bridge and I will give you that revenue for the next three or four years, we could then go and say, right, okay, that, that business is currently moving in road, take off road, can we qualify for a grant some new cranes, please? But that's not going to happen. And that, that, to me, is the issue with it. We, we have genetic growth, but we know we'll grow, but we can't actually say to somebody when, how, how it's going to happen. And in order to secure a grant, you have to have someone signing and committing to a, a specific period of time that they will move goods from road to rail. And until that happens, we're not going to get it. So. Uh, do you find that, then, that particularly FFG is too onerous and too complicated? I mean, for example, like Montrose... Harbour, who were successful mm -hmm. in getting a grant, had an expert consultant uh, employed for a while to make sure all the boxes were ticked and they were successful mm -hmm. in, in fairness. Mm -hmm. But I mean, is the scheme itself, notwithstanding your comments mm -hmm. about a customer's inability to sign longer term contract, is there an issue about the, the grant scheme, particularly FFG, being too onerous and too complicated? I wouldn't say so. I think the issue is just the change in the world and, and the way things are tendered nowadays is causing the biggest problem. Um, I mean, we, we, we've had a number of FFGs over the years. We've done them all ourselves. We haven't used consultants. And every application we've put in, we've been successful with. So the pro there's nothing wrong with, the, per se, the process. I think the change in climate has changed the circumstances which makes the um, rules around the grant difficult to comply with. Okay. Mr. Russell? I'm sorry. sorry. Mr. No, I, I, think, I think I agree with that, no, all down to this word commitment. And we've, we've all supported the grant internally. We haven't used external consultants. But likewise, I think we've always matched the minimum pound for pound you know, for grants being available as well. So again, we've committed to it. Um, it comes down to this word commitment. You know, committing to something you don't have a commitment for. You know, in this day and age, you know, it's quite a challenge with some of the margins that we're actually you know, working mm -hmm. to. Ms. <laughs> Mills? Just, just again, you know, it, it's difficult. I mean, the lack of commitment has always been a feature of our business, and it's, it seems to be becoming more and more so. Um, it doesn't seem to be the same issue south of the border. We, we, we have a degree of commitment, and certainly in the bulk sector, uh, customers, the, the big waste contractors, etc., will commit for a period of time. But in the intermodal business, no, mm. it's, it's here today. And I think probably because Grangemouth is there, you know, that, that's the difference with us. They have a real choice, and they're not going to say to us, we'll put these boxes on. Because our customers themselves work in a changing market. You know, they don't, they don't get commitment from either one either. They, they can be flavour of the month with the producer, the shipper at the moment, and then next year they'll say, sorry, I'm using another shipping line. So he can't really commit volume mm. to us. You know, it's, it's, it's a different... So just a difficult trading environment. Yeah. Thank you for that, Kavita. I think that covers the points that I had. Thank you very much. Um, moving on, Mary, you have some questions? Thank you, um, convener. Um, and indirectly, a number of the questions that I would have posed to our panel today have been um, answered. I wanted to ask the panel about efficiency and, and carbon emissions. And you'll know that the government have set, has set quite an ambitious target to, to reduce a, a emissions. And within that, the modal shift from road to rail can contribute significantly to that. And initially, I wanted to ask about how, you, how that could be improved in efficiency. But we've talked about um, height and gauge restrictions. We've talked about longer loops. We've talked about freight priority. Um, We've also talked about the rail link to, to, to depots. So is there anything that, you, that you've not mentioned um, which could help improve the service that you provide, which has the knock-on effect of, of reducing carbon emissions? And is there any other initiatives that the rail freight industry has that, that can contribute to reducing carbon emissions? Um, well, I think it's a well-known fact that rail is more environmentally friendly with 30-35% than road. Um, obviously, roads getting getting more environmentally you know, efficient you now with the new Euro 6 legislation that's come in. The capacity we're now trying to carry, what we're trying to do on that side of it. I think we've probably summarised you know, everything we've discussed. Yeah. It, rail's all about volume. Yep. The more volume we get on, the more efficient it is, the more effective it is, the more carbon neutral it is as well. So it, it's every element you know, of trying to make it more flexible, but also get more capacity on it you know, at the same cost base or the same unit cost or lower unit cost as well. 
Do you think, though, not enough is, is, is done to promote the link between all those efficiencies and the impact that it has on, on carbon savings, whether it's the, the, the longer loops, the bigger, um, the, the longer trailers, the different gauges, mm -hmm. the, the links? Is, is the importance of, of those initiatives um, being stressed enough? I think it is. I think every time we, I know that when we sit as a group, mm. we certainly raise that very much. So we're not used to looking at an isolation of mm -hmm. one part. Yeah. Because we are all, we are all the conscious of the part mm -hmm. we play in the environment. Yeah. And I think we're all very conscious of the part we play as well. And I think as I said earlier on, I'm road transport at heart, mm -hmm. but we brought rail to Malcolm's. We don't want to put any more trucks on the road. We want to see our growth coming through, utilising existing trucks better, mm. getting more capacity onto rail and let these trucks hopefully support the rail. They both work hand in hand. So I think the, every part we've discussed is all key brought together, mm -hmm. and we do share it you know, amongst ourselves. Okay. Mr Russell? I, I think you have a fair point. I'm not sure, actually, it is the connection to the carbon emissions, mm. is there? I think it's more a connection to the, um, the commercials mm -hmm. that is there. Um, and um, it may be an element that, as an industry, we could do a bit better in terms mm -hmm. of spreading the word of what the actual impact could be on carbon. Mm -hmm. um, I've got to say, as an industry, especially the rail industry, but equally the road mm. industry, um, we get on and do the job and we don't shout about what we're doing. Um, and general public won't realise the implications of you know, a load going by road against a load going by rail. They just want to turn up in a shop and get what they want. So, and what happens behind the scenes is not understood at all. Mm. So you, you, I think you have a fair point. Okay. I know what um, Andrew said, 33% Freightliner mm -hmm. estimate that to be much higher and it's because of the profile of our trains. Um, the wagons that domestic trains use tend to be uh, 54 foot long or 45 mm -hmm. foot long with one box on it. A deep sea intermodal train is 60 foot long and can have up to three 20 footers on it so our trains can carry many more boxes therefore the, the benefits go up. As far as doing the, the kind of trying to reduce emissions, again, it, it's a commercial issue and if we can save money on fuel, that's what we'll do, that's what will drive it. So y your driver is, is not essential to that, but because you're driving to reduce cost, again, the, there are some innovations in the domestic market, the, the new WH Davis wagon, 45 foot long, which, which saves space on trains, which means you get more, container trains, uh, more containers per train, and similarly, electric traction that saves from diesel. Less loops, longer loops would help as well um, and that's getting worked on because obviously it takes, uh, the reason we use electrics in Scotland to move the container trains to the ports is simply because the, the loops and an electric train can get out of loop much faster than a diesel can and build its speed back up. So I suppose more, more electric on, on the line would, would be a, a benefit as well. But we, we, we continually invest in trying to reduce, we've brought out new locomotives new wagons, which are more track bogey friendly etc. So reduces carbon there. And also we have a big road fleet. Um, so we don't just look at it in rail, we look at it in our road, because we're doing the extra mile by road as well. So I think the whole industry is very focused on it. You know, so. Do you think there's anything else government should do to, to, to make that link between efficiencies that you could make in the modal shift and, and the, the, the benefits in, in carbon savings? I think the one thing that we don't have very good, done very well overall is a single measure. Mm -hmm. And you know you can go onto the internet and find various different measures on how you measure carbon. And uh, I think that in itself creates a mixed message, mm -hmm. which dampens the benefit of what we're trying to achieve. Okay. So I think if we can focus on, you know, having an agreed, concise measure on what we're doing would be beneficial. And how, how would that be agreed? Would that be industry and <laughs> government? Or? Industry, government yeah. um, and your trade bodies. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. You, you mentioned earlier um, electrification of, of the line north of Perth. Um, are there any other parts of Scotland that would benefit from further electrification? Well, we mentioned the one, obviously, mm -hmm. to Grangemouth. That's the principal one that we, that's our highest volume mm. line there. I mean, from a freight perspective, electrification added, added adds a gauge enhancement. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, even if there's a route 
that would benefit for passenger, but not necessarily for freight. The outcome is gauge benefit. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm not sh I'm not the one to ask what routes would be right for passenger trains, um, as opposed to what we've got. Mm -hmm. But uh, certainly, from a freight perspective, you know, if it works for passenger as well to help support yeah. the cost of it, then it's a different argument. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ms. Walls? I think, I think the main routes are, are covered, or if mm. they're not covered, they're being worked on. You could say, right, OK, there's a, there's a, a bit of track over there, maybe mm -hmm. we should look at doing that. But you have to look at, are you going to get the benefit of that? Yeah. How many trains a day are going to run over that? And where's the cost, the cost benefit going to come? So I think Network Rail are on the case as far as electrifying where they can. As Kenneth said, first of all, we need the loops to get the trains bigger, and mm -hmm. then you know, electrification is <laughs> the, the second cherry in the pie. So I think you know the West Coast Main Line's done, East Coast Main Line's in the process of being done, and that's the main arteries. And if we ever get this other third route, <coughs> yes, obviously. But um, the outlying parts, um, I'm not sure whether Teesport, is that electrified? It's not. The, the final mile is not. No, it's, it's electrified so far, and then mm. you have to change to a diesel local. So I suppose to the hull ports, but that's not in the gift of the Scottish Government. So, But there are various routes throughout the UK. Maybe we could do with a tweak, but I think in Scotland there, there's a pretty strong lobby mm. uh, up here for what we need. So I think Network Rail are on the case. OK, thank you. Thank you, Convina. Thank you. Uh, Mike. Um, I'd just like to put on the record, just to extend my thanks to, uh, to Andrew and Kay for the time you spent with us and the hospitality during their visits. I particularly, I think, found the visits very, very useful in informing our consideration of this inquiry. So thank you very much for that. Um, a lot of the ground's been covered. I'm going to try and condense it a wee bit just because we're maybe chasing the clock a wee bit. Um, in terms of, w would you agree that... Um, uh, an, an updated uh, national freight policy is required. I mean, I believe the current one's 10 years out of date. Um, I'll, I'll condense the questions. I'll roll them into one. The second part I wanted to touch on is to what extent you feel that um, planning uh, policy and practice, both through the National uh, Planning Framework 3, um, but more general policy and local policy, supports the... Um, uh, rail freight uh, sector, um, or doesn't, as the case may be. And thirdly, are there any uh, lessons from, say, European countries in terms of government policy or assistance uh, for the rate, uh, uh, rail freight um, that we can maybe learn lessons from? So basically, those are uh, those are the three points I, I, I would ask you to comment on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, convener. So planning system, um, government freight policy and lessons from other parts of Europe in terms of infrastructure. Who wants to go first? I think there was a recent uh, planning framework come out. David Spaven, Rail Freight Group, was talking about it where rail was barely given the mention. There was umpteen schemes for ports, etc., but rail just seemed to have dropped off the radar. That's an issue. Now, that might be a, a problem that we have as rail freight operators and rail freight and logistics partners, that we don't shout enough where other modes maybe, maybe have a, a better audience. And that's probably something we have to do. I, I think you know we have to be careful that we make sure that every mode is catered for and people make sure. But quite honestly, I, I think there is a lack of a strategic plan to benefit the whole of Scotland. I think people tend to look at their own areas and say this is what we want we're a very small country if there was a strategic vision for Scotland, individual people might not think that's the ideal for them but if we have something to work to, you'll do it if you know it's going to be there, there was a discussion yesterday at the Network Rail Joint Board where's the right place round about Aberdeen to have a freight terminal, a big freight hub for active potential Aberdeen and there's five potential sites now if somebody just chooses one of them that's fine, we'll all work to it but there is this to it, oh, I want it in my place, and I want it. In. And you saw it especially when Channel Tunnel um, was being built. There were umpteen councils, etc. we want a terminal. Without a business case, without knowing whether there was going to be traffic to support that terminal, these terminals were built because it was great. They didn't actually ask the people, are you going to use this? It was just, we want one in our, our constituency. And there was a lot of uh, terminals mothballed and underutilised after that. Public money. 
it was it was a bit mad, really, you know. So no one would invest in a business without doing that. So you have to have a business case. If you're going to build something new, you need to know where the traffic's coming from. And, you know, best case scenario, if there's a dirty great factory down the road producing 80 or 90 containers a day of goods, it's a banker, there's something coming out of there. But we seem to put terminals in the wrong places, you know, or big RDCs in the wrong places. And I would have thought, you know, you've got the co-op one halfway along the M8, you've got Livingston. No rail link near it. Why? Why was there not some thought given to the fact that this is going to generate a huge amount of business? Why doesn't someone try and site it near a rail link? So I think in terms of that, I get frustrated. You know, you're essential, I've alluded to earlier. Why was there not a passenger halt there? Why is there not a rail freight facility in Antipray Head when Kenneth's got a terminal and so has Andrew sitting across from it? You know, it's frustrating. I'll take a yes for the yes. first two parts of the question. <laughs> Which other country can we learn from? In terms I was, of government help and well, I would say, I, I don't know. The only, the only place I do know who specify if a factory that's built as a rail link into it is Switzerland. You know, they, they really, they just, as far as they're concerned, roads are, you know, roads are, are meant for other things. You know, the rail, if you've got a, a production facility that needs a lot of product in, product out, get a rail link into it and I think probably learn from them. Great. Thank you very much. That's very useful. A anyone else got comments in this area? I think that goes happen in reverse for other European countries. I mean, in the UK today, we do have a very effective logistics service and how we respond to the needs of the market. But in the UK today, we've also got a very strong culture of, I mentioned earlier on, of just in time, just in time, just in time, which by default does not give a very efficient logistics operation. Our European counterparts are more relaxed on how they manage the requirements of goods, which gives transport providers, whether it be road or it be by rail, more time to manage the resource more effectively and more efficiently. I mean, one thing we measure on road transport very closely is our empty mileage, and we'll never eliminate it. But if cultures were to change, we could reduce it significantly, which would have an impact on the, on the part we play with the environment. And the same would happen with, with rail. As I mentioned earlier, we are trying to get more and more customers' goods that are time sensitive onto rail, but the penalties that come with that. So. The Europeans have got a more relaxed attitude to just-in-time than we have within the UK. The Europeans also seem to have a more relaxed attitude on how they um, comply with their own European legislation. We're very, we're very compliant in the UK. They're probably 95, 99% compliant in other parts of Europe. So it's kind of got that, that balanced standard. Um, we talk about you know, the likes of um, the free strategy. I think there is need to be more joined up thinking or a uh, consultation between the UK as a whole and freight, but then freight and passenger, as I think we've referred to as well. So probably a proper you know, policy, not just in freight, on rail, is rail globally, the impact that can have, and the part that we can probably play with that as well. So I don't know that maybe <laughs> round sounds, I mean, a lot of what Key says, I think you'll find there's no agreement with everybody. It sounds great, doesn't it? We'll go out that door and we won't agree on rates, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, no, I think uh, Kay said most of that part, but I think we've got a culture within the UK we, we really need to try and, you know, change. Yeah, thank you. That's a very useful insight. And Mr, Mr. Russell? The only bit I'd add is major infrastructure investment for rail in, in, in most of the European countries is dealt with completely differently to how we do it in the UK. Um, they, they, don't, they don't have short-term views on what they're going to invest in. They really do look at the long term and what that might produce for them. And um, I, I suppose our political environment and the way we do that makes it very difficult for that, for the UK government to actually um, s tackle these investment decisions. Um, but, uh, you know, equally, if you look at the um, freight corridors that were um, set up for Europe wide and how they've been developed, um, I think the UK is the only one that's lacking behind um, so I, I, I do actually think um, we should look at how they're doing it, how they're going about it, because um, we are not achieving the investment in our infrastructure that they are. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, convener. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mike. Um, bring, pulling it all together, um, we've covered a lot of ground um, this morning. Um, your last point about the need for a long-term view of investment in the real network it's an interesting point, but we've also covered the need for uh, investment in infrastructure more widely, the operation of the rail network, possible electrification, 
longer loops, as Mary Fee mentioned earlier, improvements to gauge capability to take higher and wider containers, improvements to the, to the road network to address the, the, the last mile into the port. Is there one specific ask that you would have of this committee that you would want us then to take to government in terms of what would make um, the freight um, industry um, what would benefit the freight industry in, in terms of your own individual businesses, but more broadly, the, the, the freight sector as a whole? Is there, is there one thing that we should be asking of the government that would make a difference, would deliver real positive benefits to you, both to your industry and to the sector? And if we can maybe start with Mr Malcolm and work along. Um, every, everything, everything's been quoted there by yourself just now. No, everyone's relevant. Um, if I looked at my business and my current business needs today to sustain what we're currently doing in rail and develop what we're doing in rail, and I mean our investment will be in no gauge. If gauge happens, then we'll have to invest in containers. That, that's not a problem. We'll invest in them because that gets standardised equipment. I used it earlier on today than the one, and again, it's probably out with this committee's no remit as well. If there's a way we could even get something on weights. And I say stress again, we had it many years ago, and uh, we've got trucks today which are designed to run at 50 tonnes gross, running at 44 tonnes gross. If we can get a benefit where we can make a level playing field or the actual carrying capacity of freight to and from the terminals, now, I don't think that's rocket science to do it. I think it could happen very quickly. There'd be no investment to do it, because the trucks and the trailers are all designed to do it. Yep, the trains can handle it. It's only legislation to allow us to do it. And I think if that legislation came in somewhere we had a number of years ago to allow us that enhanced carrying capacity entry in a restricted radius of a rail terminal, it will give the opportunity to start focusing more goods onto rail that currently bypass rail. And that, that's, one, that's one request I certainly would have very high up in the agenda. I've raised, agenda sorry, I've raised it through the FTA, the RHA, not through the committee, but that's certainly one that would give, bring rail into a level playing field with road if not an advantage over road, if we could get that extra capacity. If I choose one and he choose one, do they both go through? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I must admit what Andrew says is, is absolutely right, um, but uh, I, I think simply longer, heavier trains would make a big benefit for us, even within Scotland. Aberdeen and Inverness routes, if we could get longer trains, that would have a big advantage. Um, but for the overall freight market, um, longer, heavier trains. Um, but I, I do support what Andrew just said as well. OK, asking you will receive. <laughs> just, just in recognition of what we already have, we've got rail terminals in Grangemouth, rail terminals uh, in the west of Scotland, uh, Glasgow, they've got Coat Bridge, some cracking sites, but they, they could do with a tweak, they could do with some investment, and I think a realisation of what they actually do and what they bring for Scotland. We're well, well served, uh, certainly in the central belt for rail terminals, and I think, you know, I hear other people saying, oh, it would be a good one to put another one there. No, it wouldn't. All you would dilute is what's currently moving through the existing ones, and you'll end up closing them. So I think probably the recognition of the infrastructure you've got, enhance it, and then we'll look to the future and go on from there. And I suppose um, what you're doing today is great. You're, you're listening to the industry, and everything will change. Everything consistently changes. So if you just keep in touch with us and make sure um, that that continues. And as far as, as the enhancements, I agree with Kenneth and uh, Andrew. You know, to the north would be good, longer loops. The more containers you can put in a train, it cuts the unit cost, therefore you'll, you'll attract more business to rail. So that's the way to do it, is to enhance the network. OK. Um, thank you very much. Can I thank each of the witnesses for their evidence this morning and also for assisting the committee with our fact-finding uh, visits, which we found incredibly helpful. So thank you once again. And I, that now concludes uh, this item and today's committee business. Thank you.